very much. <coughs> I welcome members to the 25th meeting in 2015 of the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee. As always, ask members to switch off mobile phones, please. And I welcome Richard Baker back to the committee. Agenda item one is just to ask whether Richard has any interest to declare, please. I don't, can we simply draw members' attention to my register of interest? Super, thank you very much. Agenda item two, then, is a decision on taking business in private. It's proposed we, proposed we take items 11 and 12 in private to allow the committee to consider the evidence received on the Land Reform Scotland Bill and the Succession Scotland Bill. Do we agree to take items 11 and 12 in private, please? Yeah. Kip. Agenda item three, then, is the Succession Scotland Bill. Um, and it's oral evidence, uh, and firstly, we're hearing from the Law Society of Scotland. We will shortly hear from the Faculty of Advocates, and lastly, from a panel of legal practitioners. It's my great pleasure to welcome John Kerrigan, who's representing the Law Society of Scotland. Good morning, sir. Thank you very much for coming along and agreeing to be grilled. Um, we have... Um, an interesting problem of trying to understand all this, as you'll appreciate, as, as laymen. We also have extensive notes here, and we also have to try and work out which questions we ask of which panel. So if there's a degree of confusion, even in my hands at the very start, um, that may be something we can sort. I think questions one and two. Sorry? I think, actually, I'm going straight to John Mason with what I think is question three. Thank you, John. Sorry, I wasn't uh, quite expecting that. That's fine. Um, as I understand it, there's a, well, there are the possibility of two uh, pieces of legislation on succession, and furthermore, the provisions of this bill could be amended by secondary legislation. Um, I mean, considering the impact on uh, practitioners, uh, if you saw the government's response last week to questions, uh, I wonder if you were reassured by their explanation that it would only use the amending power for fine-tuning, uh, which would be well publicised in advance, and so I think did not need to... Uh, go back to primary legislation. Yes. You are satisfied with the government? Yes. Right, right. Uh, okay, thank you. I think that takes John Scott then. Thank you very much. And um, in oral evidence, the committee last week, the, the government and the SLC defended the inclusion of guardianship within the scope of Section 1 on various grounds. Does the Law Society want to comment on any aspect of this defence? Uh, for example, does the explanation that parental rights and responsibilities will cover most situations adequately take account of the increasing role of stipends in families? I think my answer to that question is yes. Um, I think our concern was that uh, there could be situations where uh, a couple become divorced, etc. Um, but if one of them died they would not have any objection to the other uh, being guardian uh, of a child that was involved in the relationship. Uh, I understand the government's position on that. The Section 1 does say that the will can provide otherwise. Um, there may be a question as to whether or not the legal profession gets up to speed on that quickly. But I take the point that uh, if a guardianship provision was revoked by divorce, the uh, surviving uh, party could seek parental rights, etc. There is a question of time involved <coughs> Pardon me, in that. Okay, thank you very much. Another aspect of the Scottish Government's defence of the current scope of Section 1 related to the possibility of a person subsequently applying to court to be appointed guardian. Um, can you shed any light on the likely timescales and the costs associated with doing that? Because we wouldn't want the costs... Um, to, to stop such an application where there was hardship involved? Um, the likely time scale depends on whether or not the application is challenged, uh, defended. If it was an undefended application, I actually had notice of this point and I spoke to one of the senior solicitors in our family law department and she indicated to me three to four months if it's undefended. If it were a defended application, then it could take a year and a half or longer. Uh, and costs, in any court action, costs depend on how long the court action runs. But you're talking about possibly significant cost if it's defended. Quite. Could I, could I be yeah. uncomfortably blunt? What's a significant contact cost in the context, please? Well, it depends on the client for whom you're acting. But if the client can't get legal aid um, and the bill comes to £6,000, it could quite easily, if it was a defended action, yeah. 
Um, I would regard that as a significant cost. In, indeed, so would I. Thank you for thank so, you for that. So, number. do you regard the uh, situation as satisfactory then, or unsatisfactory, or is there something else we should be doing? The only way you could change it would be to change section one to say that it would not apply to an appointment of the surviving spouse, civil partner as guardian. Right. Okay. Otherwise, you are left with the situation that you have outlined. But it would need to be written either into law or into the will, I suppose. Yeah. Uh, and, in and fairness, they're, section they're, one does say that you can yes. contract out of its terms. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks very much then. Um, the, uh, the government's bill and trust power appear to have a slight divergence in relation to domicile, in relation to section one, uh, divorce, uh, dissolution and annulment. Uh, the government's position is that it's the domicile at the point of death in essence, that applies, uh, whereas trust bar are suggesting that, uh, seem to be suggesting it's a domicile at the point of the ending of the relationship in legal terms. Uh, what are the pros and cons of that? I can understand trust bar's attitude because uh, what, it, what is the situation if you have a couple who are domiciled in Scotland um, and they become divorced in Scotland and then uh, one of them moves permanently to France, becomes, domi becomes domiciled in France and dies in France. Arguably, Section 1 might not apply there, if it's domicile at date of death that matters. But in, if you are domiciled, for the sake of argument, in France at the point of death, uh, will it not be French civil law that will cover the estate that's derived? Um, Yes, and leaving aside issues around heritable property, perhaps, it would, that yes, might be different. Yes, it would be the, the law of the place of domicile that would apply to movable property. So that, that at least is the Scottish law interpretation of private international law. Indeed. So, so therefore, what the government is proposing at least has the merit of synchronising um, the law that would apply yes. at a single point in time. So that might be said to be the advantage. I, the I understand the government's way. argument. I understand the government's argument. This is a law dealing with succession, and succession arises from death. So I can see, I can see the point of the government's argument there, but I can also see the point of the trust power argument. Well, that's, that's a very, on the one hand, on the other hand answer, which I, I understand. Um, would you choose, please? <laughs> would I choose? I think, frankly, I would choose the law of the domicile at time of divorce. Uh, if that were to be the case, um, what second level effects might derive from that that would add or subtract complication? If you're talking about somebody who has heritable property in Scotland, and I take your point entirely, if they go to France, the law that would govern the succession to their estate would be French law. Uh, but if they have heritable property in Scotland, um, the argument could be that that might still pass by the will which is unrevoked because if the revocation takes place at death and not at the time of divorce, then if the original Scotsman is now domiciled in France, his heritage might pass in terms of his will which was unrevoked because he's not domiciled in Scotland at the time of death. So, just as a layperson, to be absolutely clear what you're saying, that that would be an effect if we were to apply the domicile at divorce rather than the domicile at death? Uh, no, if you were to apply the domicile at death, then that would be the effect. Right, so it is the more complicating one? In my view, yes. Right. Now, uh, just to be absolutely clear, you're appearing uh, in front of us on behalf of the Law Society. You are speaking on behalf of them when you say that, are you, rather than them in a personal capacity? I would say that was a personal view, Frank. Right. Okay. That's helpful. Thank you. Yes. Good, good to know. Richard, I think, uh, question nine? Yes, my question is on the Society's suggestion, which has also been made by Trustbar, 
that the scope of sections three to four of the bill on rectification of wills should be broadened to include wills drafted by the testator themselves, such as handwritten wills or wills created using templates which have been found online. Uh, we're asking why you prefer this approach, and it's not a danger that the broader these provisions are, uh, the higher risk, the risk that every disappointed beneficiary will seek to use the powers in question. I understand that uh, the Scottish Law Commission's view was that it, it should not apply to homemade wills. Um, I think their view was not based on that risk assessment. I think it was based on the fact that if someone makes their own will, what evidence do you have, can you have, that that's not the will they intended to draft, they got it wrong? But, I mean, it's really if they've made a, a will online or, or, or use a template, I mean, the, the capacity for errors are, are, are much greater, are they not? And does that not impact in terms of the, yes. the, the, the provision section three and four have made around, you know, um, assessing what's a simple error? And does that not become quite difficult at that point? It's a question of, of uh, evidence. Um, it, if you're saying that you can rectify a will which has been drafted by a solicitor, uh, because there was a, an error in the drafting, then you would need to produce evidence that that was the case. And I see no difference. No difference. In, okay. it's, it's, it's an evidential point. Okay. No, fair point. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I just wanted to be quite clear. Is the point that's being made that it's the process of review, a, a third party looking at the will, working with the person who's drawing up the will, whether they're doing it on their own account or with professional advice, that touches on this matter? Or is it the fact that the third party is someone who's legally qualified and therefore might be expected to get the legal aspects of the bill correct as distinct from the intention? Hmm. Is, is that where the distinction lies? in all of this? I think that is where the distinction lies. There was a recent case in England, uh, Marley against Rawlings, uh, where L Lord Justice Neuberger uh, introduced a caveat into the English application of their version of this rule. And he said, where the lawyer gets a legal term wrong, that's not a simple mistake, which can be rectified. In a subsequent case, uh, the word issue um, had been used by the lawyer it was intended that uh, it, the evidence was that it was intended that the deceased testator wanted to include stepchildren in the bequest. But the way the lawyer had drafted it and using the word issue meant they weren't included, but they were not given relief in that case. So the, 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 the point here is that if there is a profession, someone who's legally qualified and in good standing with a mm. profession, uh, has put a term which has legal force in other contexts into the will, then that will have a much higher certainty about intention placed on it that would than appear if I disappear into a cupboard and write something down yes, in half an hour. That would appear to be a caveat which Lord Neuberger introduced in relation to Marley against Rawlings. And that would equally apply in Scotland. That would, yes. be, a, that would be a case yes. that would... I mean, if I could go back to the last point, I, I, I think it's fair to say that there would likely to be uh, more cases of people turning up and saying, that's not what my uncle intended. Because lawyers practicing in this field very often have people turning up saying, we want to challenge that will because it's not what he intended. And the law at present has a degree of certainty in the sense that you can say to them, well, the courts interpret what's on paper. Yep. Could I just pursue that and, and ask why you were so certain that an English case would apply in Scotland? Uh, I'm just... um, I was giving it as an example. Right. But I think that in Marley against Rawlings, they did uh, make reference to a Scottish case, Hudson against St John, in 1976. Right which was inconclusive, I think. But they did make reference to a Scottish case. OK, that's, that's helpful. Thank you very much. I'm wondering if I could then just go on to the time limit for rectification, um, <clears throat> because some of our evidence suggested that 
people were concerned that the date of confirmation might take a long time to come. Yes. And it might be better to have a time limit that ran from the date of death and different times were suggested. I wonder if you could give us a, a, a view on that, please. It can take, uh, in some cases, several years to obtain confirmation. Um, I think if someone had difficulty with the will and wanted to see it rectified, they shouldn't uh, be allowed to wait until six years had passed. I mean, I know that's, that's the extreme case, but I do agree with some of the concerns which have been expressed about time limits. Could you suggest, and again, it may be a purely personal view, what you feel might be a sensible time limit? Others will undoubtedly, later witnesses will probably have a view. I'd just like uh, to, to my see what... My personal view would be one year from date of death. Right. Thank you. That, that, that's helpful. Um, one of the other things that uh, came up was in evidence last week, the Scottish Government uh, confirmed that revocation does not include a reduction of a will in court. Um, do, does the Law Society have any concerns about that? Please. I think, I think our concerns are related to, and it was just a drafting tweak, if I may say so. It's section five of the bill. Uh, section five, subsection one, subsection B. The subsequent will or part of it is revoked. We felt that the necessary uh, point here would would be made by is revoked by the testator. If you had if you added the words is revoked by the testator, because a will can be revoked as you have indicated by a court, and it can also be revoked by the application of an old legal presumption called the conditio si testator which is, I think, still out for consultation um, in the second consultation document. Right. Thank you. Grateful for that uh, suggested tweak. I think that takes us to John Scott's place with question 15. Uh, Thank you. Convener, um, can I now take you to section 9 and 10 and the time of death? And in the Law Society's written evidence, you and indeed Trust Bar take issue with section 10.4, which prevents Section 10 from applying when the testator is one of the people who dies simultaneously or in an uncertain order. Can you describe the nature of your concerns in this regard, perhaps with the help of an example which could occur in practice? Well, if Section 10 were to apply, there could be a situation where <coughs> pardon me, intestacy arises. Uh, Scottish courts and Scottish lawyers have always sought to interpret a document so as to avoid, uh, avoid intestacy. Um, and I think, we think, section 10, subsection 4 could have that result in certain cases. Uh, and we're not sure that section 10, subsection 4 really adds anything to uh, sections 9 and 10. So, would you agree then with Trustbar's point um, that the word uncertainty uh, in, in people who die uh, where simultaneously or where the order of death is uncertain, that the use of the word uncertain is likely to need to not just uncertainty but unnecessary litigation? I, I understand their point, yes. And I think they cited a case in which the word uncertain uh, did appear to lead to litigation. So, right, thank you very much then. Stu. Um, I'm going to go all vice presidential here. Um, isn't it certain that in some circumstances there is uncertainty, whereas in other circumstances you're uncertain as to whether you should be uncertain? In other words, there are sets of circumstances where it is clear you cannot resolve the answer to the substantive question. Mm. In other words, the fact of uncertainty is itself clear, that there it must be uncertainty. Whereas in other circumstances, it, that might not be so clear. If Let me give you an example to illustrate the point. Um, it's someone is shipwrecked, and there are two people who are the two people concerned. 
are adrift in a boat for three, four weeks indeed. And it may be that there's some evidence that one of them has written something that suggests they survived the other. Mm. So in that case, you're uncertain as to whether there's uncertainty. Whereas, if there is no evidence, you are clear there is uncertainty. Is that a fair comment, that there is a distinction to be made? about whether, And, and therefore, you can have an argument about whether, in law, there is uncertainty and the rules about uncertainty apply, mm. or in other cases, there is a debate about whether uncertainty should apply or not. I think in the example that you gave, um, it, if you find them both with no writing dead in the boat... Then you know uncertainty exists. You know uncertainty exists. Correct. If you find a writing in the boat, um, there may still be uncertainty. Who wrote it? Yes, it but the, un the uncertainty is now a practical uncertainty rather than a legal uncertainty. Mm. Is that, that's just the point I'm so, so all I'm saying is the use of the word certain or uncertain does not necessarily create legal difficulties because you can define the circumstances which you are certain there's uncertainty in law. I think I would say yes to that. Right. That's grand. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, I'm wondering <laughs> whether we might want to move on to the law of forfeiture, which takes us back to Stuart, I think. Uh, well, indeed, and this is now about the dead and undead simultaneously, of course, which is exactly um, the, the, the same kind of thing. Uh, but it's essentially, um, the, the Scottish Law Commission has changed its position uh, on the law of uh, forfeiture um, in 1990, thinking that it should be placed on, on statute, and now thinking that it's sufficient to uh, simply abolish the Parasite Act of uh, 1594 um, and, and to rely on common law. Are you content that that is sufficient? Um, I think the Parasite Act of 1594 has had its day, quite frankly. Uh, I mean, it, uh, it... Firstly, it only applies to the killing of a grandparent or a parent. So it, it's not like the common law, uh, mainly English common law, of a sheet and a tender, where you were not supposed to benefit from your own evil act, which could mean killing somebody else who'd left you, not your grandparent or your parent. There's been considerable doubt in Scotland as to whether or not the Parasite Act uh, applies only to heritage. And it also had a very unfair aspect to it, because again, applying the old Norman concept of a tender. Um, if I killed my father, any benefit uh, under the Parasite Act, I would be deemed to have predeceased my father. But any benefit that he had left in his will to John Kerrigan, whom failing to his issue, was attainted. And they were not entitled to succeed, even although they were wholly innocent. So that has to go. Um, I mean, I think that the recommendations contained in uh, this bill on forfeiture um, are good. So, in, in essence, giving the courts the, discre the total discretion yes. makes more sense yes. because you can cover, in particular, eventualities not yet foreseen. Yes. Um, I, mean, I mean, the one that came to my mind in the current environment is where someone has assisted travel to the Dignitas Clinic in mm. Switzerland to, yes. to die at the choice of the person who is dying, yes. but who is subsequently determined to have acted in some respect illegally, should not necessarily be disbarred from total inheritance. And that seemed to me to be a reasonable place to be. Um, that would be my personal view. That would be my personal view. Is this a view that changes over time? I mean, you're, you're going back to 1594, but if you go back to the Old Testament, where the sins of the fathers are visited unto the sons and unto the next generations, which was, I think, the accepted practice then. Um, is this not a, something that seems to change? Uh, as Stuart has said, in 1990, the Law Society had one view. Today, yeah. we have a different one. I think everyone's entitled to change their viewpoint. And quite frankly, uh, I'm glad that we don't apply the lex talionis as required by the Old Testament. An eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. The point I'm making is it seems to vary. Um, 
I, again, expressing a personal view, I think the Scottish Law Commission said quite clearly that uh, the Parasite Act should go. Um, I think the, the Scottish Law Commission said quite clearly that the court should be uh, given discretion to give 100% relief from the effect of the Forfeiture Act. Um, and they also said quite clearly that where someone is guilty of uh, murder, culpable homicide, manslaughter in England, um, they, uh, and, and they are not given relief, they should be treated as if they had predeceased the, uh, the person who's been murdered or who has died. And I think that's entirely correct, because if you look at the case of Hunter Petitioner, um, the husband who murdered his wife, her will provided, I think, uh, in his favour, whom failing other beneficiaries. Uh, and the court took the view, disagreeing with the view of the Scottish Law Commission, as expressed in 1990, that the husband could not be treated as having predeceased. Um, and that meant that the beneficiaries, who were totally innocent, who would have taken had that rule applied, and that's what's being proposed here, were excluded completely. Now, a, a, an example uh, to the opposite effect in England is the case of Dr. Crippen. Dr. Crippen was convicted of murdering his wife. He was condemned to hang, which he was. Just before he was hanged, uh, he made a will in terms of which he inherited the wife's estate. Um, he made a will leaving his estate to his mistress, and the relatives of Dr. Crippen challenged that will um, on the basis, I think, of the old medieval rules of his street and attender, and were successful. Whereas in Hunter Petitioner, the family members who were innocent were excluded from succession. Thank you. Right, uh, in which case we move on to protection of trustees, I think, with John. Yeah, thank you, yeah. Um, yeah, section 18 talks about uh, protection of trustees and executors in certain circumstances and uh, introduces the idea of um, making inquiries as any reasonable and prudent trustee would have made in the circumstances of the case. And the suggestion has been made that that it might suggest there's a requirement to advertise uh, if there's uncertainty as to who uh, beneficiaries might be. Um, I wonder if you think that is the case, and if that would, if it was the case, would that have an impact on efficient and timely administration of estates? Uh, I don't think it is the case. The Scottish Law Commission didn't think that was the case in 1990. If it became a requirement to advertise, um, it would interfere with the timely administration of estates. So, do you see this as a change from the present practice? Or yes. Is it you do see it as a change? Yes. In that there's more encouragement to advertise? No, I would... I, I, I would it, it, solicitors will advertise uh, for a will. If a client comes to them and said, my uncle has died, uh, I know he made a will because he told me and he showed me a copy of it, but we haven't been able to find the copy and we don't know who holds the will. Right. You would advertise in those circumstances for somebody holding a will, for example, for the late John Kerrigan, late of such and such an address. Um, I can't recall seeing an advert saying, we hold a will granted by the late John Kerrigan. Right, so if, I mean, if a will said just was quite vague in saying children and stepchildren or something like that, and there was a kind of vague idea there might be people out there, would, a, would an advertisement be placed in that kind of situation? Um, yes, that, that would be, a, a, I think, a one-off situation. And most solicitors would deal with, with that by instructing genealogists. OK. So you, you wouldn't really see any particular problem with uh, this section? Um, I, as far as delaying things is concerned? I, I, would, I would not like it to become standard practice that you had to advertise that you, hold, you held a will granted by a particular deceased. Okay. Be because you would have to await responses to that. I, I agreed. I, I just wondered, I mean... In, w I wonder if the courts, how they might interpret it, I, I take your point that you wouldn't want that to become standard, happy to agree with that, but um, I, I wonder if some of your um, fellow professionals might kind of take an, an extra defensive position by advertising. They might. I mean, every, every solicitor uh, will follow his own gut instinct in a particular case. 
Okay. But, I mean, if you were talking about would it be uh, negligent of an executor uh, not to advertise, um, I think that there could be very limited cases where, yes, an executor would be advised to advertise, but not across the board. Okay, thank you. The last question relates just generally to the recommendations that were made and whether or not you feel they've been adequately um, implemented. Um, because the SLC made a number of recommendations relating to private international law in 2009. Recommendation 50, that the Scottish courts should have jurisdiction when the deceased died domiciled in Scotland and when he, he or she owned land or buildings in Scotland. And recommendation 45, recommended the capacity to make or revoke a, a will should be determined by the law of the status domicile at the time of making or revoking the will. Recommendation 50 has only been partially implemented and recommendation 45 is still being consulted on. Is it, in your view, desirable that reforms to a complex subject like private international law should be split over two pieces of legislation? How do you see the balance of all this? Quite clearly, there are going to be two pieces of legislation. So uh, if these matters are dealt with in the second consultation, which was published in June, um, or as a result of further deliberations, then yes. As a, a practical matter, there are going to be two separate succession Scotland Acts. Clearly, conceptually, that's not as good as one bill would have been. No. Um, does that, in practice, put you in any particular difficulty, bearing in mind that most of Scots law is pretty dispersed? Uh, my own personal preference would be that there be a consolidating act, which would incorporate the provisions of this act to follow on this into one act so that you have one source. If we were to do that, would there be other extant materials we'd want to put in or need to put in to that, or is it just about running the two together? I, I guess what I'm trying to say is how much, how much statute law on succession is there out there which would need to be in a consolidating bill along with the two that we're to currently talking about? Well, you've got the Succession Scotland Act 1964, which mm -hmm. in large measure would be replaced by, I think, the second act, right. which is going to deal with the more controversial aspects. Uh, the Succession Scotland Act 1964 mostly deals with intestate succession. Mm -hmm. And the uh, matters presently being, well, the consultation period, I think, has now ended. Um, but the matters in the second consultation paper were largely on protection from disinheritance and... Uh, intestate succession. What I'm saying is the Succession Scotland Act 1964 is likely to be largely replaced by whatever second act is promulgated by the Scottish Government. Okay, if I'm interpreting that properly then, that does suggest to me that if there were to be a consolidation, it would want to be, if I may, may invent a term, a complete consolidation. Yes. So that we were getting rid of absolutely everything into one statute yes. at the moment. Yes, I, I, I think that would be preferable. Yes, okay, thank you very much indeed. Right, do colleagues have any more? No, I think that's us for the moment. Thank you very okay. much, thank Mr. You very Kerrigan, much. and I shall briefly suspend the meeting while uh, witnesses change over. Thank you.
Right, I uh, welcome at this stage uh, witnesses from the Faculty of Advocates, uh, Laura Dunlop, QC, uh, and Wojciech Jadelski. I think I've got that right. Thank you very much for coming along. Um, and I will open the questions, and I think you've seen the format. Um, the Faculty of Advocates provided a written submission, which we're very grateful, which indicated a high degree of satisfaction with the bills currently drafted. On the other hand, Trustbar, a group of advocates practicing in the area of disputes relating to succession and inheritance, made a number of detailed points relating to policy content and drafting the bill. Does the faculty want to comment on any aspect of what Trustbar said, please? I'm happy to comment on specific aspects of Trust Bar's response um, if that arises in, in further questioning. At this stage, as a general comment, I should explain that I am the coordinator, as it were, or well, the convener of the Faculty's Law Reform Committee, mm -hmm. and um, I coordinate what consultations we will respond to and what ones we won't, and I um, select a committee um, with the assistance of the other members of the Law Reform Committee, we choose a committee to prepare a consultation response. The practicing membership is over 450. In recent years, a number of special interest groups have been established within the faculty. Plainly, their raison d'etre, as in this case, is to look at matters of trust and succession. And people who are interested in and um, also have expertise in these areas tend to um, form the, the membership of such groups. And so they are, as it were, taking an independent look at uh, a reform proposal such as this one. Um, the faculty's own position is that uh, when we are preparing a response on behalf of the whole faculty, we try to have that exercise carried out by members with experience in the area of law. Um, sometimes that's easier than others. In this instance, we responded to the Scottish Government's consultation I think it was last autumn, um, which covers most of the material that's in the current bill, and the committee which prepared that response, which was a group of five people, um, had expertise in this area. Once we've done something like that, we try to be consistent in what we say on proposals, and um, that's, I suppose, reflected in the evidence that we submitted. Um, it's obviously entirely a matter for Trust Bar if they want to come along and um, raise different points. Uh, if, if the faculty takes a position on an issue which we would regard as policy, legal policy, and the government decides not to go with the faculty's view, then we would probably regard that as a spent argument and we would move on. Um, whereas uh, Trust Bar, for example, might want to um, make a, a policy point again. They might want to to try before this committee to make a policy point which appears to have been rejected by the government. Thank you. That's a helpful clarification of, of how that works. Thank you very much. Uh, I think at this point I go to John Mason. Uh, okay. Thanks, Convener. Um, I mean, clearly one of the issues that we just touched on with the previous witness was the whole fact that we're having two succession bills uh, at the moment and uh, one theoretically dealing with the less controversial matters and the other one later on probably the, the, the more substantive things. Uh, I mean, is that a situation that you are comfortable with? Is it just the way it is, or is it not ideal? Well, to a degree, it's uncharted waters. I did try to think yesterday of other areas of Scots law where this kind of law reform has taken place, where you have a, a small act and then a, a bigger act coming. And it's actually quite difficult to think of a, di a direct parallel. I can think of areas of law reform where there has been one major measure and then a smaller act coming afterwards that tidies up some of the practical questions, but it's difficult to think of it the other way around. On the other hand, I do understand the thinking behind trying to extract the uncontroversial parts of the succession proposals and put them in a short technical bill. I understand the reason, what I think is the reason for that. I accept that it has generated rather a mixed bag of proposals which um, only have in common the perception that they are less controversial. Um, would it have been better to put these proposals into the main consultation paper? Well, the main consultation paper, as you probably know, has 71 questions already, so it's very large and taking a lot of work. And that kind of linear progression, obviously you're giving up the chance of parallel working, which is going on by choosing to do it this way. You can have the... Um, short bill going forward at the same time as people are making up their mind on the, the longer consultation paper. 
I am a former law commissioner, so I am aware of all the um, reasons why this procedure before this committee was introduced in the first place, and it is a good idea. It may be that uh, the first bill, the um, Legal Writings, Counterparts and Delivery Bill that this committee considered under that process will turn out to have been a more suitable measure because it was a discrete piece of reform, and this isn't. Um, but the committee will obviously form its own view of that at, at the end of the process. Uh, it's very difficult to say that this is uh, the way that this is being done is clearly wrong. Um, and can I link to that, uh, Section 25 of this bill, uh, under ancillary provisions, gives Scottish ministers quite uh, wide powers uh, to amend by regulation. And I think there's been some suggestion that, uh, in this case, it, it should be primary legislation that's used again if there's to be any amendments. I mean, do you, do you have a view on that yourselves? I, uh, the faculty as a whole doesn't, hasn't really taken a position on that and would... Um, really rest with the assurances uh, given that um, this would not be used to effect substantive change. Thanks so much. Thank you. I think that takes us to Stuart, does it, with question eight? Um, yes. Returning once again to the issue of uh, domicile. Yes. And um, in our previous evidence session, we perhaps had the arguments um, on both sides of the, 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 the case uh, for whether the domicile at the point of the ending of the relationship in law or domicile at the point of, um, uh, the point of decease uh, should carry greater weight, and the bill goes for the latter. How do the faculty see the balance of argument there, and do they think the government has come up with a better answer? Well... Um to reiterate the point I made already about an attempt to be consistent, we certainly didn't flag this up as a concern when we responded last year, but in view of the fact that it obviously is of concern to others, we have revisited it to a degree. I think the first point I'd like to make is that this is a default rule for people whose relationship has ended without their taking any action to change a will that, that makes provision for their ex, if I can put it colloquially. And the solution that's in the bill of using the law of the uh, domicile at the date of death, um, that means that at death there is a deemed predecease. So the divorced partner um, is treated as already having died. I tried in preparation for today to think of circumstances in which this could produce an undesirable outcome. And as far as I... Uh, can calculate, I think the possibility of an undesirable outcome is um, very small because you would be talking about somebody who divorced in country X who checked that by the law of country X the provision in favour of their former spouse or partner would survive and on that basis didn't make any new testamentary provision. They then moved to Scotland and become domiciled here and it's our different law, the fact that we've chosen to use the, the law of the testator's domicile at deceased would um, effect that change that the person didn't want. But I found that quite an implausible example because somebody who has checked what the, the law is at, in country X is quite likely to be attentive enough when they move to Scotland to make a different testamentary provision um, here to protect their former partner. And this, this class of person who wants to benefit their former partner, uh, notwithstanding a, a divorce or termination of civil partnership, I suspect is a pretty small class. Can I just challenge that slightly, if I may? Yes. Because you appear to be invoking the law of assumption in that, is it not the case that only a minority of people write wills in any event? and that therefore most people's disposal of their assets at death is based on people having a broad assumption that the right people will get it, rather than they're actually doing what you've described, which is a systematic and uh, rational approach to the, these matters. I think this is a, a question which is bedeviled by lots of assumptions, actually, and that there is a, a quite 
um, major underlying assumption um, beneath the whole thing, which is that the majority of people would not want their ex-spouse or partner to continue to benefit um, by means of a, a testamentary provision that they've forgotten about or, or not done anything about. Um, and I think if, if that's the, the general assumption, then the, um, the, the route that the, the bill is taking uh, is quite a sound one. Um, the downside I thought I could see if you made it a question dependent on the, the law of the domicile at the time of the divorce or the ending of a, a civil partnership, then you are introducing into the administration of the executory a question of what we still call foreign law. So you would be stimulating a factual inquiry as to what the testator's domicile had been at the time of the divorce or the ending of the civil partnership, um, which is the first question, and then a question as to what the law of that place is on the effect of divorce or dissolution of civil partnership on testamentary provision. So the, the downside I see with, with going with the alternative is that you are generating a degree of uncertainty. So the executors would have to establish what may have happened, and I use the word may deliberately, in another legal jurisdiction, and not all legal jurisdictions are as accessible as some. Some will be yes. difficult to deal with. That is possible, and there so, will have been the passage of time. And, and the provision that's in the bill basically plays to the common assumption that people will have that they've cut all ties with a person whom they previously had that relationship with. And anyone who thinks it should be otherwise has the way of making a testament that takes account of that, which this would not discount. Yes, I, I agree with that. I think what, what we're... Um, debating, I suppose, is not really an argument as mm. such, but mm. the, the debate is between do you fix it according to the law of the place where they were domiciled when the relationship ended, or do you just say at the time of death, if they are domiciled here, we treat the former partner as, as, we, as uh, we deem them to have predeceased. The bottom line is when somebody dies in Scotland, the law of Scotland cannot be removed from working through the consequences of their death in testamentary terms. So therefore, to have some of it somewhere else is merely complicating. I think one could suggest that that is a right. greater complication, yes. Thank you. Fine, thank you very much. I think that takes us to Richard on revocation. Thank you, Convenia. Uh, earlier, I asked uh, Mr Kerrigan about the Law Society's suggestion that the scope of sections three to four of the bill on rectification of wills should be broadened to include wills drafted by the testator themselves, such as handwritten wills or wills created using templates found online and trust bar also have made the suggestion as well. I'd just like to get your uh, opinion about that proposal. Thank you. I have looked into this and the first thing to say is that in the faculty's response a year ago, um, we supported this narrow provision, if, if I can style it such. So um, I, I would look to be consistent in relation to that. The um, Law Commission in 1990, uh, as Mr Kerrigan suggested, um, articulated concern about the fact that people may have made statements to relatives. Um, they may have been not totally frank uh, or they may have changed their mind because, of course, the, the time at which the intention matters is the, in, is the time when they are actually making their testamentary provision. And the Law Commission was persuaded by the difficulties of um, comparing what is in the will with supposedly some other evidence about a different intention. Uh, the, Law Society, the Law Commission was persuaded um, to uh, restrict its recommendation to the narrow type of measure. There is an interesting interplay in any uh, law like this between rectification and interpretation and it is sometimes said that if you have a wide door for rectification you only have a narrow door for interpretation. Well this being a narrow door for rectification it may be that the courts would take a, a more generous approach to interpretation. And if, if somebody has made a bit of a mess of their own will, which they've done themselves, um, the courts might be prepared, and I accept this is speculation, but they might be prepared to be more generous in interpretation if it is reasonably clear what the testator was trying to do. Um, so I, I don't 
um, want to advance a position any different from the, the Law Commission's recommendation that this is uh, confined to really quite a narrow uh, scenario. And I, I um, note that that appears to be the position in England as well. It's a fairly narrow um, rectification provision that operates in England. So you, you don't see the, the, the danger which, um, again, the, the Law Society didn't, didn't see either, that you know, uh, uh, the, the broader these provisions are, uh, the higher the risk that every disappointed beneficiary will seek to use the powers in question. I mean, that's... I, uh, well, it is speculation, but no, I would agree with you about that. I think it's, it's very hard to limit the use that would be made of a wide provision. And the faculty, in its response last year, also made the point that um, it would be difficult to be selective about the intentions that one would be trying to reflect. So, for example, if the testator's intentions had been to be highly tax efficient, and it turns out that the will that's been made is not as tax efficient as it might be, would that be good enough um, to uh, open up the will? So I think on, on that basis, the faculty did support the more narrow form of provision that we now have. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. I think that takes us to John Scott, question 14, actually. John. Thank you very much. Um, and I want to turn now to section 9 and 10 about the time of death. And again, um, in the written evidence, the Law Society and Trust Bar take issue with section 10.4, which prevents section 10 from applying when the testator is one of the people who die simultaneously or in an uncertain order. Do you have any comment you wish to make on this topic? The, I noticed that in the Law Society response it was said that it's slightly difficult to discern the thinking um, behind 10.4 and I would agree with that. So what I go, I'm going to say about what maybe the intention is really speculation, but I wondered if the inclusion of 10.4 is really just to reflect the policy that underlies Section 9, um, I did try to think of an example, uh, and the, the one I came up with was if I um, make a testamentary disposal of my jewellery, such as it is, and I say I'm leaving it to my two cousins, and um, if uh, I die and then my cousins die simultaneously, then um, according to the, the first limb of Section 10, then the, the jewellery would be split between their estates. But if I perish too in whatever the calamity is, then the jewellery doesn't actually go anywhere near my cousins and their uh, heirs, their family, their testamentary provision. That's just effectively disregarded. And it, it didn't strike me as a bad result. I see. So and, but I, I emphasise that's my speculation as to what the thinking may be. Um, I'm not convinced that I'm right. Thank you. i just further ask you about um, various sections in 9 to 11 and people dying simultaneously of where the order of death is uncertain is referred to. And Trust Bar make the point that the word uncertain is therefore likely to lead to unnecessary litigation. Is that a view you would share? I had a look at the case that's referred to, I think Trust Bar made reference to the Lamb case and the first instance judge in that case did find it difficult but my view on looking at the appeal decision was that Lord Wheatley had sorted it out and he had said, and I think this was really um, alluded to earlier when Mr Kerrigan was giving evidence, Lord Wheatley had said, and this is Mr Stevenson's point, that um, round one you decide, well, is there evidence to show on a balance of probabilities who died first? And if there isn't, then you move to this, uh, you move to whatever the, the statutory rules are for a situation where it is uncertain. I don't think that the use of the word in, is in itself problematic. I see. Right, thank you very much. Thank you. That takes us on to the Mr Stevenson on forfeiture, I hope, please. Indeed. Uh, it's interesting, the legislation website 
says the Parasite Act has no legal effect, I note. Uh, so presumably the repeal of the Parasite Act is not something that's going to uh, cause any concern. But to, to the extent that uh, uh, the, 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 the section in which this is dealt with, Section 17 in the, the bill, uh, describes uh, what should happen uh, and leaves quite a lot of common law in place. Is that is that a reasonable outcome? Basically, that the courts can look at individual cases, and there will be very, very few in number, after all, um, and, and come to the conclusions on the facts of the case. Is that the right place to be? Well, I did look up the Parasite Act yesterday. I looked it up in West Law, which is, um, I suppose, a, a commercial, but it's a... a resource, legal research resource used by almost all of us. And according to Westlaw, the Parasite Act 1594 has been in force, is in force, and has been in force since the 8th of June 1594 uh, until the present. Um, the only thing that's uh, particularly striking, well, not the only thing, but, but one thing that's very striking about it is that um, legislation clearly used to include some adjectives of outrage which is a practice that um, has uh, fallen into desuetude, um, perhaps fortunately. But I, I don't see a difficulty with the line that's being taken, that if you repeal the Parasite Act, the position that you're leaving is that the um, circumstances in which forfeiture will ensue are left to be dealt with by the common law, and that is consistent and allows the law to be developed by the courts on a case-by-case -case basis. It's not a big area of law. Perhaps in a perfect world, if you were trying to produce a complete statutory code for succession, you would include um, in that statutory code a chapter dealing with this sort of situation. But my sense of the whole succession law reform project at the moment is that there probably has to be at least a degree of triage so that if something is not causing much practical difficulty if it arises quite rarely and if it can be left to be dealt with by the common law then it doesn't need to form part of this legislative reform. Um, articulating principles uh, on the number of issues that would need to be considered would in itself I think be quite a time consuming task and it might be disproportionate to the benefit. Um, but perhaps on the other hand, in this case, we're using the legal mechanism of saying that the person who committed the crime that led to the death is deemed to have died before the person who physically died. And when we were looking at uh, the law of domicile in relation to relationships that have legally ended, we're also using the mechanism of deciding that the partner who's no longer a partner legally died before the person... But in one case, we're legislating, and in the other case, we're leaving it to common law. Why the difference? I suppose because the range of factual circumstances in which right. one person may have some kind of connection to the death of another is potentially very broad. Okay. That's fine. I can't help reflecting that's an interesting basis on which to... Legislate. If I took that, to, forgive me. If I took that to, to the limit, then we'd be saying that all the standard cases are the ones we should legislate for, and anything that was difficult and pushing this absolute to the limit should be left to the common law on the grounds that it's far better to let the courts sort out the detail than us to worry about. Quickly. <laughs> That's with respect not fair. It's not consistent, but I believe it was Churchill that said that consistency, of course, is the hobgoblin of small mind. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, I wonder if we might move swiftly on to the last question, which I asked Mr. Kerrigan, and I'll come back to you, and I'm hoping that uh, you're familiar with this. I don't have to go through all the words. Uh, you'll perhaps be aware that Recommendation 50 from the uh, Law Commission's 2009 report um, has not been completely... Uh, implemented that recommendation 45 is still being consulted on uh, the net result is we'll have a complicated subject of private international law across at least two pieces of legislation and some of it incomplete and i'm just wondering whether you've any comment on how that should be addressed the only comment that i think i can offer is that again there is a choice do you include a specific um 
PIL provision within individual sections dealing with a certain scenario? Do you add at the end perhaps a subsection saying what the PIL position, private international position, law position is to be? Or do you have a chunk of your legislation which deals with private international law in a one -er, as it were? Um, there are advantages and disadvantages of both. I can understand why some um, provision for private international law is being made along the way in individual subject matter specific sections. Would you agree with what I think was Mr Kerrigan's position that once Parliament gets around to consolidating these two statutes that we are currently working on, that that should be a complete consolidation of previous statutes to the point where, at least in theory, at that point we have everything in one document? I do agree with that, with perhaps the small caveat that there is a painting the fourth bridge dimension to it, in that um, one can never be totally satisfied that one has everything, and there are likely still to be measures which bear on succession present in other statutes. But yes, I, I can see the need for a consolidating act at the end of this process. Right, thank you very much. Do colleagues have any other comments? No, at that point I think we come to the end of that evidence session. Thank you very much uh, for your uh, evidence, which has been useful and helpful. And we'll just suspend for half a moment. Thank you very much. Uh, we can reconvene. It's uh, my pleasure to welcome, welcome Ailey Scobie, who's the private client partner from Burnett and Reed LLP, and Alan Barr, who's a partner in Brodie's LLP. Um, and I think my first question is that from a practitioner's perspective, what are the key areas of concern associated with the bill? Is there anything you'd like to see that's been left out, please? Who'd like to? Um. Barr. I think it's, I mean, the, there are obvious things that have been left out or at least deferred, um, notably in the kind of original consultation and this potential legislation, uh, there was bonds of cation um, and yep. a, a fair amount of proposed reform in these, or at least possible reform in relation to these, that is forming the subject of the second consultation uh, or part of the subject of that. Uh, a point you were making at the end of the last evidence session on private international law, that there were some other bits of that um, that might have been in this as well. Um, so, uh, as has been implied already, we're kind of left with, with a relatively random selection of relatively small points. 
Um, and I would endorse what has been said earlier about very much wanting um, some version of consolidation of two new pieces of legislation that are likely to be in successive years. It seems very strange that, particularly with two Law Commission reports, we moved from an act of 1964 um, and then various talk of legislation over that period, nothing, and then suddenly two, two acts. Would you like to add? Yes, thank you. Can I add, I agree exactly with what Alan said, but we have been having a little problem in Aberdeen where the sheriff, um, some 50 years after the last Succession Act, has suddenly started taking a different interpretation of the people who can be appointed executors. And it's justifiable, but nobody has actually had the guts to go and debate it with him. And it would be nice if, in some bit of the forthcoming legislation, it was set out who and in what order could be appointed executor. It's primarily at the present moment, if there's no will, it's those with a beneficial interest. But it would be nice to have that set out as priority. Yeah, thank you. Can I, can I say that that's a, a point that I am well aware of and have had correspondence personally about yeah. it. I think I suggested to the faculty in Aberdeen that they write to the government about that. Clearly it would not be appropriate for this bill, but it's surely mm -hmm. something which could come into the other bill if it's brought to the government's attention. So I would encourage them to do so. Thank you. Um, I think that probably takes us on to uh, John Mason. Yes, I, mean, I suppose you. following on from that then, I mean, do you think it would have been preferable just to delay this bill and, and put it in with the, the second one that's due to come in due course? I do. I, the, the danger in that is, I think, that because this is, if I can put it this way, more technical than policy, uh, I imagine that the concentration on the second bill will be on stuff like the protection from disinheritance, um, like the, the intestacy rule, and, and therefore things that are essentially technical and frankly not very commonly arising would not get this kind of attention and that would be the loss in not having them in this separate bill. So uh, for that reason alone, it is good to have that consideration. But in terms of, of sheer efficiency and what we end up with, I think we'd be better with, with a, a consolidated bill. And we can still get there if we take the results of this and put it into a... a, a, a simply slot it wholesale into a, a second bill. I'm well aware in saying that, that the uh, assuming that it can just slot in neatly uh, to a, a second bill, uh, I can see parliamentary draftsmen tearing their hair at that and saying it's not as bloody easy as you think, um, and I can well understand that, but I, I would hope that with new legislation it might translate into a new bill fairly readily. Okay, thank you. Did, um, the, an, another point that's been raised is the, the whole question of uh, Section 25 um, giving the Scottish ministers quite wide powers uh, to amend uh, and so on. Now, they've said that they would only use it for fine-tuning. Um, uh, do you find that satisfactory? I have a preference for things of substance being done by primary legislation and getting this kind of attention, uh, so therefore... Uh, if one accepts what is said about, about fine-tuning and that provides a more efficient parliamentary process and more likelihood, frankly, of getting things changed that need to be changed, that, then that is, that is acceptable. But, okay. but I would entirely agree that things of substance should be before the whole parliament rather than ministers. Okay, thank you. I think that takes us to John Scott for question seven on section one and the effect of divorce. Indeed, and of guardianship and thereafter. And I just wonder if you would uh, tell us if provisions in a will appointing a spouse as a guardian of a child um, fall within the scope of Section 1. I mean, should that, should that be? Would you, are you in favour of that? Um, I think that the danger has already been mentioned is that a spouse who is also the parent of a child in question, of course, would continue as guardian. So this is appointing... Um, a, a more or less formal step parent as the guardian um, therefore you have a situation where that appointment could disappear if this legislation came forward now again you're making this assumption of what people would like I think there's certainly a decent case that that actually if they've been in a in a quasi parental relationship with the child then regardless of the of the split up of their relationship they might be quite happy for that to continue so it's a question of one assumption over the other as it were um, that there is scope to do something about it for the divorcing parent um, but they have to remember to do so otherwise this provision would take them out of the, out of the picture and I would just endorse what was said earlier pretty well exactly about the time scale and indeed costs 
of needing to apply for guardianship if that was what was required. It could, it's very unlikely to be less than, than um, some thousands of pounds to do so, and that seems a bit wasteful if it could be avoided. Right. Okay. Thanks very much. I think that takes us to question ten with Richard on powers court to rectify will. Thank you, convener. I'd like to uh, ask you, 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 your view of the, the question I raised earlier around the Law Society suggestion that the scope of sections three to four of the Bill on Rectification of Wills should be broadened to include wills drafted by the testator, such as handwritten wills or wills created using templates, which have been found online. I'd just like to get your, your view on, on the suggestion which has been made. I've seen a will um, done off the internet where the husband paid for his will but was a bit of a cheapskate and used that will to do the same for his wife. And he changed the first line and got her name right but immediately appointed herself as a beneficiary. Now, that to me is a classic case where this sort of remedy could be useful because you can see what happened, um, although um, maybe spending another £15 would have resolved that. Um, but... Uh, <laughs> It, it it doesn't if you permit um, wills that are done other than by a lawyer to be changed through this route it doesn't say that they will be changed and it's up to the court to decide and if you have to litigate to change then the costs of litigation are in my experience a real deterrent unless there is um, largely agreement that the change within the family, that the change is the right one. And of course, you can't get agreement properly if one of the beneficiaries affected is underage or is incapacitated for some other reason. So I would see that, the widening it, as being useful. Because there's, there's those impediments there in practice. Yes. Therefore, you don't believe it's going to lead to an explosion of beneficiaries challenging wills. In fact, there's, there's, a, there's enough uh, you know, impediments there already to them making spurious claims, for example, through this. That through would this be my thinking okay. for the average estate. For your mega millionaire, it's, the risk is different. Um, there to safeguard the yes. integrity of the intention. At least. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. There's, Sorry. There's two no. points on that, perhaps just to, to expand slightly. I mean, this is providing a remedy that's, that exists in a kind of different form now because if there is a serious allegation or serious evidence that a will has not been prepared in accordance with instructions, then it is possible to sue the person preparing it with some difficulty. I mean, this is an expansion of, of, of litigation uh, called White Against Jones in, in England that spread to Scotland. So you have this remedy. Now, that this would therefore be an alternative, particularly if everyone was agreed that, you know, what the intention was has not been fully ca carried forward. So in a sense, it's replacing one fairly unlikely set of, of, of litigation with a different set of, one hopes, fairly unlikely litigation. One thing that I would... Um, follow up on is the in the world in which we live then wills off the internet more or less are of course very very common now i don't know and i would not know from that legislation is that being prepared by the testator directly or has that been prepared at the testator's direction in other words if you have a kind of interactive website that you fill in some bits but either involving a human being or involving software what you get back is not only just what you have typed yourself is that your own will or is that in somebody else's instructions i, I don't know the answer to that um i and and i think that that should possibly be be covered uh, one way or the other either by exclusion or by inclusion by making clear which that is. That should be in legislation itself rather than left to the courts. I, I think it has to be. Uh, I mean, otherwise the courts will have to decide that. Is a will prepared in that way, one professionally prepared or one personally prepared? And, and I, you know, I genuinely don't know what the answer to that is. But I think that you could answer that by saying one way or the other. We certainly wouldn't want to finish up in court to have to find out. Uh, yes, it seems indeed. a bit of a waste. Uh, uh, John, yeah. In reality, will that not be the only way that it can be decided in court as to whether it's Professionally the prepared opportunity or not. of including wills that have been done over the internet expressly, then you don't need to look at how that's done. You still have the complainants um, arguing about what the man wanted, and that's a different problem for them. But it does enable these wills automatically to be within the category of cases which can be reviewed. 
Thank you. I took a full step earlier. I think Stuart Stevenson would like to go back to section one. Forgive me. Um, yes, I do just want to exercise my privilege. At what age can someone uh, make a decision as a beneficiary? Well, happily, if you were the lawyer dealing with it, 18. You could, in theory, do it at 16, but it's vulnerable to being challenged because okay. you've taken advantage uh, of them. I, so you would say 18. I don't want to make a meal of it. I just <laughs> happened to know that my mother was an executor at the age of three. Oh. Wasn't she lucky? But, but of course... She must have been precocious she, in reading and writing. Well, I think she probably... Let's not go there because I, I cannot know. I, I, I merely know her father acted in her stead. That's all I know. But, but much more substantially, um, I wanted to just explore the issue of uh, domicile uh, as, uh, I think it's 1D one, one in, back in Section 1, uh, as to whether the arrangements that essentially the domicile at the time of death... Uh, are preferable to domicile at the time of the legal ending uh, of um, of a relationship. Uh, certainly what's emerged, particularly from the Faculty of Advocates, would lead us to the conclusion that what the Bill says is preferable. I think that what you're going for here, what you must go for here, is... is certainty one way or the other and this is not a you know 100% one way and 0% the other I, I would be slightly more only slightly more in favour at the time of the divorce uh, because you know you're likely to know the domicile at that time and all that Scots law can direct then is what happens at that time um, if you do it at the date of death, then you're, you're potentially into the realms of private international law at that date. But you're going to have been in the realms of private international law at one of the dates anyway. Um, I, I don't think it makes very much difference. This is certain in that way. Uh, what we would be saying if, we, if you went for the domicile at the date of the annulment is that that's what Scots law is directing. If that's a Scots law divorce or annulment, then the will comes to an end at that point. Now, if the person was then domiciled elsewhere at the date of death, they would look to Scots law um, at that time or possibly at the date of death. So you'd still have that confusion as to wh which one governed at that particular time. Uh, do forgive me, are there jurisdictions where unilateral divorce is possible, where the person who has now died may have uncertainty as to when, how and where that divorce took place and certainly might not have known about it. They might have died without knowing the divorce has taken place. Scotland, if you've disappeared. Uh, it, it could, it could ah, happen. Ah, yes, yes. yes. Mm -hmm. it, it could happen. Yes. yes. So, so the, 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 determining the, the law that applies at the point of death has a degree of Pretty absolute certainty. Death is more certain than divorce, that's for sure. <laughs> Indeed, if not in the modern world, necessarily more inevitable. But there we are. Could I just pick up, forgive me interrupting, could I just pick up on the, on the issue of domicile, which you have just referred to, of course. How clear and certain is the concept of domicile? You, not, it, not very is the answer, I'm afraid. Um, it... it applies, it is scattered throughout our law for various purposes. Um, it, it is by no means 100% certain. In the tax world, they are looking at trying to tie down, there is a, a, an element of statutory definition of domicile in some aspects of tax, uh, UK tax in relation to this. Um, but it is overlain by the, the common law of, of where somebody is domiciled, even in the tax world. It is not certain. It is very hard to make it certain and if you were going to change that then I think you'd have to move to a, a, a different kind of test um, like length of time of residence. Residence itself is a bit more certain but, but domicile is pretty uncertain. I'm just wondering if on that basis it might be more sensible to have domicile at the time of death which might, not least because it would be later, be slightly more certain than domicile at the time of a, an annulment, which might be very uncertain given some of the lifestyles of the modern world. 
the ball has stopped moving at the time of death, so you're able to, to as it were, take that snapshot. Uh, the reason why it's, it is likely in most cases to uh, have arisen at the time of divorce is that, of course, that would affect the question of where the divorce itself is likely to have taken place. Standing the ones where you might have, of what I would describe as informal divorces, you're likely to have to address that issue or some similar issues if there is an international dimension to when the divorce has taken place. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm wondering if I could then go... On, on, can I Sorry, come in on one of aspect of, of domicile? When you get confirmation, which is the lead from the executors to get access to the deceased money, you make an averment of domicile but without doing very much to substantiate that. You, if you have residence in Scotland, nobody queries it in practice. So that might be an issue with this debate discuss. Please. Indeed. I'm wondering if I could then go back um, to the issue of rectification and the time within which that might occur. There uh, had been some discussion within our evidence as to whether that should be from when confirmation is granted or the date of death, and if it were from the date of death, whether it might be a longer or a shorter period. Um, do you as practitioners have a view of where that might sensibly lie, please? I would um, very much favour the retention of period from the date of confirmation, because until confirmation is granted, the will is not a public record document and most solicitors handling an estate where there is contention will not release the will until they have to, in other words, at point of confirmation. So to give a time limit um, within which the, con the, the will must be rectified means that um, those who are executors have control on the timing of getting confirmation and therefore would delay that if it was in their personal interest. Very easy to make it more than six months anyway. Thank you. It's a very practical reason for giving us uh, uh, yeah. a, a way forward. I'm very grateful. The way that it's been done is a kind of dual system. If there's confirmation, it's six months of that date, and otherwise it is from death, but there is then the follow-up. You can go for, uh, uh, for on cause shown out with that six months for good reason, and the kind of deliberate delay that Ailey is talking about would be a good reason to, to go out with that period if that became relevant. Would it be fair to say that the courts in general have a discretion to deal with time limits on, on cause shown? No? No, unless specific. They, one is often told they do not, and that's the end of it. Is that something we should change by statute in general? Gosh. Uh, this is an extension, but we've got that. I think you're working to it. That's, that's a very big question. Yes. Well, I know it's a big question, mm. but you're here, and I've asked it. Yeah. I mean, yes. is, is it one worth considering? I, I would say yes. Sorry, you don't have to give me the answer to beyond it's worth considering. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, that was well off-piste. Um, right, I'm wondering if we could go, I think, with John Scott to question 14. Is that right? Is that where we've got to? Yeah. And, um, survive. Thank you very much. And in the written evidence, the Law Society and Trust Bar take issue with Section 10.4, which prevents Section 10 from applying when the testator is one of the people who dies simultaneously or an in or in an uncertain order. Do you have any comment you wish to make on this, please? Um, well, well, firstly, I, I'm pleased to say, I mean, I, I, when this came out, I looked at it, and how often does this arise? The answer is fortunately very, very seldom. Um, in 25 years of practice, I can think of one occasion where the predecessor to this law, I've actually had to consider, and that was actually much more on the point that's already been raised in other evidence about whether, in fact, it was an uncertain or not, or what you had to do to, to as it were, produce evidence as to a more likely order of deaths. Um, so this does not happen very often. Um, and what is wanted out of this is, in the very few occasions when it does happen, certainty. And, and to be somewhat blunt about it, it almost doesn't matter what that certainty is as long as there is certainty. It's a blunt instrument at best because you're, you're making assumptions as to what somebody might have wanted in circumstances that really, in their worst dreams, they wouldn't have contemplated. So certainty is really all that is, all that is wanted. I think that the Law Society's comment was on the basis that 10.4, that which, which um, excludes uh, the... the uh, 
operation of 10 in certain circumstances and thus throws you back to section 9, well, there was no particular reason why that, that particular certainty was preferable to any other certainty. Um, and therefore, it didn't matter um, that, that um, whether 10 was excluded or not, if the testator was one of the people dying. Thank you. So, in the light of that comment, your comment, what, what would you make of Trustbar's point that the word uncertain is likely to lead to unnecessary litigation? You wouldn't necessarily agree. I don't think I would agree with that. I think that it's been well put is that there's a, a two-stage process to this. Is it uncertain at all? Um, and, and, only, and only if you're over that hurdle do these rules then kick in. Um, so I, don't, I think that uncertain is certain enough in Rumsfeldian and other senses that that is the case. Thank you. Lord, Lord, Lord Wheat, the uh, wins the day. I mean, <laughs> that's good. Thank you. Um, right, I think that takes us on to forfeiture and Stuart. Is that right? Um, just really to uh, give you the opportunity to uh, uh, perhaps agree that uh, allowing the courts to have uh, full discretion is the best outcome in the very small number of cases where it will apply, uh, where someone has, by criminal act, caused a death and might otherwise inherit. I think it's a fair approach and I have no problem with it and it leaves the court to exercise a discretion in the myriad of facts that will come before it. Yeah, I, I would entirely endorse that. I mean, the, the situation is it is so rare. It will be rarer still, but they will exist circumstances where there is a, a an act that the criminal law quite rightly recognised as criminal, but that it would be entirely reasonable for the the full effects of forfeiture not to take effect. And keeping, I, I do think that this is one where you really can't anticipate all the circumstances that might arise and try to legislate for them. I think it would be. Um, uh, it would be ambitious in the extreme to try and do so. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I think that takes us on to the uh, protection of trustees and executors with John Mason. Yes, convener, um, I mean, Section 18 talks about that, as the convener said, and in specifically we've been kind of pointed towards uh, the phrase where it says that uh, trustees are not personally liable uh, if the distribution takes place in good faith and after such inquiries as any reasonable and prudent trustee would have made in the circumstances of the case. So the question is, uh, do you think that's a reasonable wording? Are you happy with that wording? And in particular, does it suggest that maybe more advertising is going to have to take place than has taken place in the past? I would very much hope not. Uh, I think that, that if you were thrown in the situation, I mean, because this in theory envisages that you know every estate may have in it unknown beneficiaries who come out of the woodwork afterwards and that trustees could find themselves liable unless they had advertised in relation to every estate. Well, I think that's a nonsense. Uh, I hope that that would remain a nonsense. Also, advertising, you know, this is this is last century or previous century stuff. The way that the, this is done now is that if there is reason to suspect that there is an unknown sibling that's disappeared, that did exist at one time, then at that stage trustees, executors, will make reasonable and prudent inquiries. But as has been said, these tend to be by the use of professional genealogists, by starting, you know, including, again, very much the internet these days, is where you go looking in circumstances where it is reasonable to do so. Now, in the vast majority of circumstances, it is not reasonable to do so. And in the few occasions where this came out of, of the woodwork, uh, as it were, if the trustee was to find themselves liable simply because they hadn't in all hundred situations where this has arisen advertised and this has come out in one, I think that would be entirely unreasonable. So I think that the wording is fine. I hope that people do not say, ah, well, we have to be just and reasonable now and therefore being just and reasonable involves expensive and unnecessary effort in a very large number of cases for the very few cases where it might be relevant. Is, is this very different from where we've been already, or is this effectively just putting in words what has been happening in practice? I think it's giving a degree more certain protection if what I have just said does represent 
what is reasonable and prudent trustee inquiries, and I, and I think it is. I, I'd agree yeah, with that. I, I don't, I've never actually advertised for beneficiaries. Um, between private detective and the local tic tac, you can do amazing things in Scotland. But of course, if you've got people that have gone abroad, you're into a different ball game there. Or people that have come from abroad, which is even more interesting. Uh, you, you know, like Polish people who have settled in Scotland recently or after the Second War. Thank you. Thank you. I think that that's very helpful evidence to actually have on the parliamentary record. Forgive me. I mean, how you actually operate is, is hugely no. It's, it's hugely useful because it is relevant. It's what practitioners do. It's it's very good to hear that. Thank you. I'm just wondering if I could come to the final question on private international law, and you will have heard my my question to your colleagues before. And I'm grateful to to you for for being here to listen to it. Um, bits and pieces have been adopted. Some bits haven't. Do you have any thoughts about how we should, as a parliament, handle all that, please? Private international law is difficult. I mean, this is this is one of the most difficult areas, um, because you're often not just back to another system, but back and forth from another system to the Scottish system. All that we can do is to try and make our law as clear as possible, so that when other systems are looking at situations either in relation to Scottish heritage or to Scottish domicile death, standing what we were saying earlier about domicile, uh, what is the Scots law on the matter? So I think that we should be legislating for that and its effects as much as we possibly can so that other systems can look at that and know what that is and we can know what our system is when having to apply it in situations with a foreign involvement. So I would be all for including, and I think I would go the line of rather than a bits and pieces approach, trying to include a private international law section as there has been in at least one of the Law Commission reports on, on, on as many rules uh, as are up for, for consideration. Um, I don't think that there is sufficient to actually create that, even in the second consultation that's going on at the moment. It, it, it might be, dare I say, a, another project that, that needs to be considered. Um, but what we should get in is what we possibly can, and, and we should uh, legislate on it where we possibly can. Right, thank you. Could I just ask, I think that's the end of our list of questions. Is there anything that either of you two would want to add, please? Um, only, only to reiterate that, that we're very conscious. For a start, it's a very good thing that, that succession is getting consideration by, by the Parliament after a very, very long lead-in. You know, there are things that do need to be changed, to be tidied, and there's no doubt that the major substantive things are require that serious consideration. I think that, that it, we said before that it would be better if this were to be consolidated into a single succession act um, and, and if the Parliament could see a way through to do that, in other words, to do what is happening now with what is likely to happen in presumably the next session, that would be a very good thing to get it together. In, indeed. Well, I thank you very much for coming along, Ms. Scobie and Mr. Barr. Uh, can I also again thank your previous witnesses uh, and make the point to them that there's anything else that you now thinking you would like to add, we'd be very happy to receive res written submissions on any issue at all. That will be greatly appreciated. Uh, and on that point, I think I'll probably just suspend the meeting for just a moment, please.
Right, so welcome everyone back. Um, we're now going to move to agenda item 10 and we'll return to the other items on the agenda. Uh, at agenda item 10, we're seeking information from the Scottish Government on the delegated powers contained in the Land Reform Scotland Bill. The committee has seen the delegated powers memorandum and the written responses to the questions received on this topic and decided that oral evidence is required to scrutinise the delegated powers provisions. Can I firstly uh, welcome Rob Gibson, MSP, who is the convener of the Rural Affairs Committee, uh, for Rural Affairs and Climate Change and Environment for Committee, forgive me, who is attending this morning's uh, session and will no doubt have questions to ask. Can I welcome from the Scottish Government Steve Sadler, who is the Head of Land Reform and Tenancy Unit, Kate thompson McDermott, who is the Head of Land Reform Policy Team, Belinda McKenzie, Head of Agricultural Holdings and SRDP, Fiona Leslie, who is an Agricultural Holdings Policy Officer, and Andrew Campbell, who is a solicitor in the Scottish Government's Legal Directorate. Uh, good morning, one and all. Um, and can I then invite questions from uh, members? Um, and I think we're starting with John Scott. Well, thank you very much, convener. And I should first of all uh, declare an interest as, as a farmer and refer members to my register of interests. Um, my first question has a bit of a preamble, so if you bear with me. And in your written response, in in relation to section 25, you cite as an example of a code not subject to parliamentary procedure, the Code of Practice under section 48 of the Adult Support and Protection Scotland Act 2007. Now, this is a code which applies to local authority officials and health professionals when carrying out their duties. Can you explain what, if any, are the consequences of failure to comply with the Adult Support and Protection Code of Practice? And why is it considered that the procedure appropriate for that code is equally appropriate for the Code of Practice on Agricultural Holdings, given the clear effects and consequences of that code, these being that the Land Court must take relevant provisions of the code and reports of the Tenant Farming Commissioner regarding breaches of the code into account in determining questions relating to agricultural holdings? Who'd like to start? I'll answer that. Right. Um, in terms of the comparison between codes, we believe each one has to be determined on its own basis. Each one is unique. We put these examples down to show that there are codes that either have statutory scrutiny or don't. And it was just an example rather than a an exact comparison. Each one has to be decided on its own merits. In terms of the Tenant Farming Commissioner and their codes, the reason that we're taking the approach within the bill is that it's a non-exhaustive list, firstly. The Tenant Farming Commissioner can decide to expand that list and tackle other issues. Um, there's all, it's also arm's length from government, the Tenant Farming Commissioner and the commission that's going to be a part of. Um, so it's an independent body that will have its own powers. And the codes that will be developed, we believe it's appropriate the Tenant Car Farming Commissioner has the time to develop them in full consultation with the industry itself. Um, and that, that is why we've taken the approach that we have in the bill. So I think it's those range of reasons why the bill is, has the provisions it has. Um, we know it's not a settled issue. We will listen to Parliament on this throughout the process. Um, codes of practice under the provisions inserted by sections 15 and 27 of the Wildlife and Natural Environment Scotland Act 2011 or non-native species and deer management respectively are subject to the affirmative procedure for the first and replacement codes and to the negative procedure otherwise. Both codes are capable of having significant effects on individuals in the first case because failure to comply with the code may be taken into account in determining any question in judicial proceedings and in the second because SNH must have regard to the code in exercising its functions in relation to deer control agreements and deer control schemes. Why does the Scottish Government consider the approach to parliamentary scrutiny of the Code of Practice and Agricultural Holdings merits a different approach to that taken under the Wildlife and Natural Environment Scotland Act 2011? The difference there is, is those codes do have ministerial approval or uh, oversight of some sort. So ministers either do the codes or they have approval powers for the codes. The Tenant Farming Commissioner 
the codes are for the Tenant Farming Commissioner and the industry to develop in consultation. So I believe that's the difference in terms of parliamentary scrutiny. One re requires the approval of the Scottish Ministers. The other one is for the industry to shape with the Tenant Farming Commissioner. Point, um, because I note that section 25.8 says the land court must take the provision of the code into practice, uh, into consideration and account in determining various questions. Um, does that not put it in a slightly different place? It's being required that the law of the land takes this into account. So it has the force of law. In terms of how the court, we, we believe it's appropriate the court takes account of the Tenant Farming Commissioner's codes. They're not bound by it. They must consider it and you exercise their own judgment um, based on the law. And we believe there are aspects that are appropriate for primary legislation, aspects appropriate for secondary legislation, and aspects that are best left to codes of practice that the industry shapes themselves. And ultimately, the Land Court is the ultimate decision maker on taking account of all of that information and they exercise their own judgment. But if I could put the counter argument, and I do this as an MSP, as parliamentarian, if I've read that aright, what you're suggesting is that it's for the court to decide what it wants the law to be and whether or not it happens to like the guidance. Whereas I would argue as a parliamentarian that it's our job as parliament to decide what the law is and for the court to implement that. Yeah, accepted. Um, we, we believe we have got the balance right here um, between the different levels and the parliamentary process. Uh, we know that it's not the end point. Um, we will listen to Parliament on this. The Scottish Government will consider all the points that committees and Parliament makes. But we, we do believe that we have the balance right in terms of where the regulations, guidance, etc. should be pitched. Thank you, Steve. Uh, just, just to be technical point, well, clearly codes do not have the force of law. It's clear equally that they have force in law, in that they be can become a material consideration in what a court may decide in relation to some particular action. And therefore, that being the case, in other words, that the existence of the code has an effect on legal outcomes, albeit not the effect that primary or even secondary legislation would have, that it's important that such uh, codes are considered at a parliamentary level uh, to give them the necessary scrutiny because they are, instrument, they, they are matters that will affect legal outcomes. I think, as I've said, that we, we do believe that this process we've put down, the structure we've put down, is the appropriate balance um, and that parliamentary scrutiny is not required in this specific instance for the specific subject because of the reasons I outlined. However, that is not the end of the process. We will consider all the points made. Do forgive me. Uh, are you agreeing or disagreeing with my fundamental point that the existence of a code will and is intended to have an effect on legal outcomes? If, if, if I can um, certainly the, the provisions in uh, section 25 do provide for the court to take the codes into account in determining questions. But obviously that's rather different from um, the court uh, having to, to take its decision always in relation to what the code says. So the code is something that uh, the court can take into account. It doesn't necessarily mean it must always follow um, what the uh, the code says it's it's a matter for as as, uh, as policy colleagues have said it's a matter for the court to weigh up in a given question the relevance of a code to the particular question that the court is facing um so in in <coughs> excuse me in some situations yes it, it could well be a, a material um consideration for the court but in other cases it may well not be uh, so so fundamentally you're agreeing with my core point that the code can affect legal outcomes can. It's, it's certainly something that the, the court can take into account when it comes to its decision. Sorry, so I'm, yes, I'm, it, I'm going to be... It, right, so you're agreeing with me? Well, it can certainly affect because court I, outcomes, yes. Because I, th I think that point is what might underlie this committee's expressing a view, if it chooses mm -hmm. to do so, that therefore uh, the codes uh, should be subject 
to a parliamentary scrutiny because there is a legal consequence of the court. But that's a matter for the committee and not necessarily here. I wonder if I could, I'm coming back to John, it's okay. Um, I wonder if I could just pursue that point though, because surely if a code of practice lays down a procedure for doing something, it doesn't matter what it is, and there's no, <coughs> pardon me, there's no other chapter and verse anywhere as to what the right way of doing that might be. Surely the court is absolutely bound to take the view that that code of practice is the right thing for the parties to have done because they, the court can't find any other, other answer if a code of practice has come forward from the industry. So surely if, if there's no other word out and around and there's no other significant history or the code of practice manifestly overrules history, surely that code of practice does become what the court will regard as good practice and the law. It's certainly good practice, yes. Um, I, where I would maybe differ is in the interpretation that it, it binds the court um, uh, uh, in any sense. It's, it's a court of practice, it's guidance. It's one of the things the court would take into account along with many other factors in deciding a particular case. It may well be, for example, that there may be uh, reasons why in a given case that following the codes was not appropriate for the parties in that particular case. Um, and so in a situation like that, one would expect the court, yes, it's under an obligation to take into account the content of the codes, but it may well say, actually in this situation, we're bound to take it into account, but we're not giving it much weight. Okay, but I would turn that around, I think. I think this is absolutely fundamental, which is why we want to tease this one out. Uh, courts are used to distinguishing between the law as it used to be, and or they see it in generality and the particular <coughs> case in front of them, and I would expect the land court to be no different from that. But I'm still stuck with the general principle that if there is nothing to distinguish it, then the code of practice effectively tells the court what is normal practice, is what expected. It is, in a sense, writing down the common law of that subject at that time, except that it happens to be a commissioner writing it down rather than a work of antiquity which says what the common law says. It, it, how, why, why is it different in, in its effect in court? It's, well, there's a fundamental distinction between something which is law and which is guidance. And the code is a strong form of guidance. And th that's the distinction. The court ultimately remains the arbiter in a given case as uh, to the decision it wants to make. It will have the court as the, the forum in which parties bring all of the considerations of the case together. <clears throat> the code is one of those, and the court must take into account that. But it doesn't necessarily follow that what is in the code must always be followed by the court. I think we would accept that. John, would you like to continue well, our it, argument? Thank you, uh, convener. Um, I mean, if providing codes of practice is, is good practice, as, as you identify and claim, why does the Scottish Government consider that it would be unduly burdensome for Parliament to scrutinise a package of up to eight codes of practice covering different aspects of the Tenant Farming Commissioner's remit? Uh, we we scrutinise instruments many more than that on a, on a daily basis, every week, so to speak. Why would we not? In terms of the number, it's, it could be more than eight. It depends on what the Tenant Farming Commissioner and the industry believe what is needed. In terms of the appropriateness of scrutiny, we believe that the information in the bill allows the Parliament to give the proper scrutiny to this overall issue and then leaves other aspects to the industry and the Commissioner to sort out because of the technical detail and the necessary stakeholder consultation. That is the reasons why we have some aspects in the bill, so that there's scrutiny of the overall principles and approach. And in other aspects, sometimes we leave it to regulations because we believe that there's still room for parliamentary scrutiny of the, some of the more detail. And there's other aspects that are left out with legislation altogether because we believe it is for the stakeholders, the industry and the commissioner to shape them. Uh, as, a, as a committee that scrutinises the fine print of, of the way we work, the, I sense, uh, we sense, I think, a reluctance to to subject yourself to scrutiny in this regard. Um, and the examples you cite um, don't appear to us at any rate to be entirely relevant. Um, so I would ask you again, why would we not um, just, uh, as we do, we scrutinise eight or ten instruments a week on a regular basis. Why, why, why would we not be allowed to do that? I'm not sure I can add any in terms of what you're allowed to. I think that's for the Parliament to decide. Um, and 
you're asking a very reasonable question. We've given our response. It's not a reluctance for the Parliament to scrutinise, um, but we will consider these points. I don't know if Steve, you well, want. I think. <coughs> sorry. <coughs> Excuse me. I think all I would say is that across the bill as a whole, we've tried to take a balanced approach to various degrees of scrutiny. And I think I have. You know, I'm afraid I don't really have much more to say than that. I understand the points you're making. Uh, you know, I would agree with the points that Billy has made in response. But I think, as I say, look, looking at the legislation across the whole, we've taken decisions, ministers have taken decisions up to a point on the type of scrutiny that we consider to be appropriate and that, that they are in the, face of, in the face of the bill as it is now. So at that point. Thank you, Convener. Um, is there any reason why Parliament cannot seek to scrutinise any particular set of guidance if it so chooses, if there is some concern that the Tenant Farming Commissioner uh, and his work uh, requires that further scrutiny. Well. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Could Paul? Question for, uh, for President. Yeah. Delegate Powers Committee. Sorry. Um, no. If, if, if Parliament wishes to subject codes of practice to scrutiny, then that, that's Parliament's choice. Yes. In, in other words, it is. There is a choice as to whether the bill says that it will be laid or it won't, or it'll be scrutinised or it won't. But there's a possibility when the Tenant Farming Commissioner is in place, yep. um, given that he's, uh, he or she has got, got a status to actually develop these codes, that it's entirely incumbent on Parliament to be able to call in any of the decisions to debate here and scrutinise them. Uh, I'm sure that's the case. I guess what we're trying to establish is whether what should be on the face of the bill. Um, and. The government officials have plainly given their view as to the balance as, as they're putting it. Uh, and our job, I think, is to question that and, and we'll see what the evidence looks like as a totality. But, yeah, Stuart. Uh, I, th I think, Convener, there's a question as to whether it should be ad hoc or post hoc. Mm -hmm. In other words, should Parliament be involved before the code has force or it should be reviewing the operation of a code that's in force? Now, I'm not taking a view, but I would be interested to to know what practical effect ad hoc consideration might have on the ability in particular of the commissioner to respond rapidly. I'm, I'm almost leading you to an answer, but not trying to. Uh, does the arrangements that are currently proposed enable the commissioner to act rapidly in, in circumstances where parliamentary prior approval being required might inhibit? And if you suggest that is the case, can you give us an example? I, th I think it's one of the reasons that you would want s certain aspects to be left to this, the situation to develop post-parliamentary process. Um, there are some codes, for instance, perhaps around rental negotiations um, or how to take account of tenants' improvements that are going to be very complex, very technical, have to have heavy input from assessors, etc., and those in the industry. And they they may have to tweak it. They, they may get it wrong. This is a very uncertain area. There's, it's one of the reasons why we're legislating, because it's so uncertain. Or some allege that. Uh, so you could, you could get it wrong with all the best will in the world, with all the engagement in the world, and you'll have to take rapid action to correct that. So it's one of the reasons. So the, 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 the potential for urgency could underlie the justification for Parliament not having the right to scrutinise before a code is brought in. Is that what you're suggesting to the committee? I, th I think in every legislative process is a decision to make on what needs to go in primary, what needs to go in secondary, and what's left for this type of situation, guidance, oh, codes well, of practice. Do forgive me, I accept the generality of that, but we're dealing with the specifics of this environment. It would just be mildly helpful if you could identify even one scenario where you think urgency might justify the Commissioner acting in advance of parliamentary scrutiny and or approval. Rental situations would certainly be in that category. Rental situations are ongoing. They can be that you'll have rental negotiations spread throughout the year. Um, and taking quick action if there's something that needs to be done quickly and those situations would prevent perhaps adverse effects on people who are going through. If it takes three months before a change can happen, all of those involved in those 
that would have wanted to be involved in that positive change will still have to go through the old system or delay until the new system is in place. It would be an uncomfortable, uncertain territory. So rental negotiations would certainly fall within that. Tenants' improvements would fall within it because those potentially could be used on a daily basis across the country, very technical, um, and could have a significant effect. Uh, so that's another one that could fall into that category. And colleagues? Yeah. Sorry, I'm on. Yeah, I'm on. <laughs> Thank you. Um, in addition, the game management codes will be um, subject to, obviously, there's an animal health disease outbreak in game birds. There would need to be a rapid response to that, would, which would be required potentially in hours and days as opposed to weeks because of the circumstances involved. So if there was another bird flu epidemic, the codes of practice between the two parties may need to significantly alter during that time period to protect the interests of both parties and does he deal with the disease risk that accompanies that. Can I say, can I say the response we're now Oops. the response we're now getting is much more helpful in understanding your reasoning. I'm not necessarily preempting the committee's view on the matter, but I can begin to see the justification. Thank you, that's helpful. Right. I'm wondering if we can leave that subject, and John Scott can take us on to the issue of right of access to information. Please. Thank you, uh, convener, and um, take you to um, rights of access to information and persons in control of land. And uh, we're unclear as to what the policy objectives are behind um, the need for uh, such disclosure. Uh, we're also concerned about the article eight in terms of ECHR, uh, in terms of a legitimate and proportionate aim in that regard. And um, your written response to the committee states that the, the purpose in taking the power is to enable uh, information about um, individuals who are making decisions about land to be made available where this information is needed to address particular practical difficulties by persons, including the owners of adjoining or related land. Therefore, is it not possible to frame the power with reference to access to information for a general purpose of resolving practical difficulties in relation to land? Why take such a broad power if that's the policy intention that it's for? Maybe, maybe respond on that question, if I may. Um, I mean, the direct response to the question is that the, the power site out in Section 35 one could potentially be framed in, in, in the manner suggested, although obviously this is not the option that the, the, which the Scottish ministers chose to go for. Um, the power in Section 35 one is framed to make clear that the power relates to access to a limited set of information by a limited class of person. Um, given the wide range of circumstances in which practical difficulties may arise and the very likelihood of broad differences from situation to situation depending on, on the case, it was considered preferable to limit the scope to persons affected by the land rather than to limit to particular circumstances causing the effect. But by limiting it to persons affected by land, you would very much be limiting it to the circumstances in which a difficulty was shown that was affecting that, that person. So we, we have attempted to, to, to narrow the scope in the way suggested, but just by using a slightly different formulation, because we think in practice that's a preferable route to go down, then um, I mean it's, it's going to require either, either, either you know, a, a, a detailed definition of persons affected by land or definitions of what would be meant by practical difficulties in, in the circumstances, and, 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 and this, is the, this is the route we'd propose to go down. Um, certainly... Scottish Women considers that the provision as it stands adequately defines the scope of the power, um, but would be open to considering the committee's views if they thought alternative wording would be more appropriate. Well, um, elsewhere in your responses, you suggest that the purpose in taking the power is to increase transparency and accountability. Now, there's a word of land ownership. Is this additional to the purpose of enabling practical difficult with land to be resolved then what you're telling me it probably is um, uh, uh, potentially two sides of the same coin um, in a sense um, the purpose of the regulations to be made under section 35 is to provide greater transparency and accountability of landowners in the specific cases in which the provisions would apply so that um, practical 
practical difficulties can be better addressed. Well, I take your point, but we understand that the vast majority of information about land ownership in Scotland is already in the public domain and may be accessed through the land register, the register of Sassines or Companies House. So why then is a power to access information about persons and control of land considered necessary and why is it considered necessary to enable individuals within a legal entity which owns the land to be contracted rather than the legal entity itself? Um, I would certainly agree that some information is indeed already in the public domain and some information can be accessed through various different public registers. However, there's not a comprehensive and accessible source of information on land ownership in Scotland, and this was certainly one of the issues that's highlighted as a real concern by the Land Reform Review Group. Um, although on a case-by-case -case basis, if you go to a lot of effort to look through what's in the land register or the register of seasons and then look at Companies House and then look at... All, you know, you, you, you can eventually um, piece together a picture of, of land ownership for a specific case in it, for a specific piece of land in Scotland, but it's quite a complicated process that you need to go through. And you need to have some very kind of basic understanding of company law, of charity law. Of, you know, so it requires quite a, quite a broad understanding of individuals to access all this different information and pull it together in a way that, 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 can, that can be readily understood. Um, in, terms, in terms of looking at why it's necessary to look behind the legal entity, well, I mean, the, the right of ownership in land can be held by natural persons, obviously, and non-natural persons. And where the owner is an individual, it is generally very clear who owns the land, who should be contacted. And um, it will be the name of the person that's in the proprietorship section in, in, in the title sheet. Um, it can be more difficult to establish who is effectively making the decisions about the land and in control of the land when the legal right of ownership is held in the name of a company or, for example, a trust. Um, most company ownership structures are simple, but there are examples where the structures are, are far more complex. Um, examples where shares and companies are owned by other companies or other trusts, potentially in offshore jurisdictions, that require no disclosure of any information. Um, in these instances, trying to establish who it is that actually controls um, the, the land and makes the decisions over land can be very difficult, if not impossible. Um, and while the legal ownership of land may be clear, if that's um, a company registered in an offshore jurisdiction where there's no requirement to make any disclosures, or um, in a, even one registered within the EU or the UK, but where the, 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 the structure is just so complex that you can't get much further than the first two or three layers, and you're having absolutely no luck um, trying, to, trying to get a response from anybody um, on, on, on the issues that are affecting you, then we would argue that it is very important to be able to look behind that legal owner and to, to, to find out information about who it is that actually has control all over, over the land. We've just been dealing with the laws of succession, and one of the things we've been talking about is the scale of the problem. How big is the scale of this problem that you outline that, um, that there is a need to know who the owners are and for the reasons of, shall we say, mending a fence? Um, well, I think that this is one of the issues that was brought forward very strongly in the Land Reform Review Group's report, and they were certainly convinced that there was a sufficient degree of information that this was a problem that needed to be addressed. Um, we know that evidence from um, a number of stakeholders, um, such as you know, Community Land Scotland and DTAS, would point to the problems that communities for example, face and trying to address these situations. Um, we have heard from, from stakeholders involved in wildlife crime issues that they, they find it very difficult to um, work with or get contact with landowners to try and address issues that may be affecting things such as wildlife crime or the environment. So there, there certainly seems to be a, a broad spectrum of, um, inf of, 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 of evidence from a, a broad range of stakeholders that the, these issues, these issues are, are significant. Okay. Um, just ask you now, um, who does the Scottish Government intend should exercise the functions of the request authority? Um, the, the options for who will exercise the functions of the request authority are, are still to be assessed and, and no decision has been, been taken at this stage. Um, as this is a new role, it will be necessary to consider which public body or organisation would be best placed to take on the role. And, and whoever takes on the role will, of course, be set out in, in the regulations. Um, I mean, it's the Scottish Government's policy to minimise the establishment of public bodies as much as possible, and therefore Scottish Minister would be attempting to find the best and most appropriate place for this function to be exercised within an existing body or department. Thank you. 
And going back to a policy that where there is a legitimate privacy reason, such as concerns over personal safety, then the persons in control of land will not have to supply information about themselves. Why does that restriction not appear on the face of the bill? In, in drafting the provision, the Scottish Minister did not consider it necessary to provide for the detail of this to be set out in the face of the bill. Um, rather, the, the regulation making power makes specific reference to need to address these issues in, in sections 35.2 GH and I. And it would be the Scottish Minister's intentions to consult on the privacy exceptions that will be required and how a person that needs a privacy exemption can ensure that it applies to them. Um, Scottish Ministers were also of the view that it is essential to retain a degree of flexibility to ensure that these exemptions can be updated to react to changing circumstances to make sure that sufficient protection is always provided for, for, for um, persons articulate interest and rights going forward. We'll come to Article 8 later. Okay. Um, <laughs> sorry. Okay. Yeah. I, I just really find myself quite baffled by this whole concealment issue. Uh, given that the valuation role shows the owner, the resident, and the tenant, given that the voter's role is publicly accessible, even if you've excluded from the published part of it, given that if you're the owner of a ship or an aircraft, your details are published, given that if you're a company director, uh, your details are published, Given that for the payment of a small fee, I can go into Register House in Edinburgh here and look at uh, births, deaths, marriages, divorces, uh, wills right up to 12 months ago. You, you know, why in particular are we concealing uh, the beneficial ownership uh, in technical terms? I'm not seeking to ask a policy issue here. Uh, in technical terms, uh, when in many other areas of public life, uh, no such protection from identification is provided, where the effect on public policy operation is likely to be substantially less in these other areas where that information is provided. So can I just clarify, you're asking me why we're not going further in requiring the disclosure of beneficial ownership? Correct. Right. Uh, given that, yeah. your name and address has to be provided, mm -hmm. you know, valuation role, voters role, ownership of aircraft and ships, companies, directors, and information about your very personal information, your antecedents, and so on and so forth, is, is available to anybody who walks in and pays a modest fee. Why, why, why is this different? Yeah. In I, I think I, th I think it's I think it's a finely balanced argument, and I think there's there's lots of aspects that need to be taken into consideration. And certainly, Scottish ministers have had to had to weigh up the the interests and rights of of, of all parties in, in, involved in in this. Um, I mean, I, I noted that the committee papers themselves referred to the, the the corporate veil in our current structures and understanding of of of, of, of company law. Um, at the moment, there is no concept of beneficial ownership in in, in Scots law. And although we can start to consider looking further than legal entities, we need to make sure that there's a very clear evidence base as to as to why we're doing that and the circumstances in which we're doing that. And what the Scottish ministers have done have looked at the, the range of evidence about why it's important to look beyond legal ownership and to look at concepts such as beneficial ownership and controlling interests and try to... Um, bring together a, a range of, of provisions through Section 35, Section 36, completion of the Land Register, a Land and Property Information Task Force, to look at exactly how we can improve and get better quality information in cases where interests of all parties remain balanced and there's a good evidence base to, to, to establish why it's necessary to, to look beyond legal ownership. I'm just interested in this concept of beneficial ownership. Why is it important for the government to, to break new ground here and establish the concept of beneficial ownership? So I understand what you've just said, correct? Uh, yes, sorry, I was, I was just kind of reflecting that, that it's, it's not a general concept within in Scots law as it stands at the moment. It, it is a concept within 
um, English law, as I as I understand, although I'm I'm not a lawyer, so I don't want to. Right. I don't want to. Um, and certainly, if you if you look at what's happening with the EU um, fourth money laundering directive and the Small Business um, Act um, that's been taken forward in the UK, then certainly a lot of understanding and looking at concepts of beneficial ownership, but for other purposes such as um, prevention of money laundering and, and and tax evasion. So that they are they are generally well understood, legislated for concepts, but just for, with at present in, in areas where, there, where there, are, there are different policy aims and objectives than transparency and accountability of land ownership. All right, well, taking it back to um, relation to the potential for further disclosure of information, another question. You state that there may be circumstances where the information may have to be shared with third parties in order to resolve practical difficulties. Why then is there no provision in the face of the bill limiting the disclosure of information to third parties to circumstances where such disclosure is necessary to resolve practical difficulties? Um, I think we, the discussion minister took a slightly different approach on when it was most appropriate to, to apply this test. So they did not consider it necessary to, to limit the disclosure of the information about persons with control to the third parties once this information had already been provided to the person affected by land. Um, there are a broad range of, of reasons and ways in which once the information has been provided to the person affected by land, they may need to use that information to try and address the practical difficulties that are being caused. Um, as such, Scottish ministers considered it preferable that the test be brought back a stage and that the test um, to, to make sure that the interests of, of third parties are protected would be taken before or as part of the decision about whether to release the information um, to the person affected by land at all. Because there, there is no... It would be very difficult to set up a system where you could protect the information once released from becoming wider, more public knowledge. So we felt in order to protect the interests of third parties, it was better to bring that test back to part of the decision about whether to even disclose the information in the first place. Thank you. However, no, sorry. forgive me, John, if I can just put that as I've understood it. Ministers may by regulations bring forward a basis on which information essentially about neighbours can be disclosed on the basis that it will help to resolve some kind of issue to do with the neighbours and thereafter it's public knowledge. Um, there the wouldn't, yeah, wouldn't be the automatic assumption that it would become public yes. knowledge, but it would be very difficult to control or contain that information once it had been provided. So there's no expectation that it could be contained and therefore it does become potentially at least public knowledge. Yes. Yes. Thank you. John, sorry. Thank you. Um, your written response also confirms that significant aspects of the policy on disclosure of information, including crucially the meaning of persons affected by land and their criteria for requiring the disclosure of information, are still under development in consultation with stakeholders. Why should the Scottish Parliament confer power on the Scottish Ministers to legislate for this matter when its purpose and indeed its parameters are not yet clear? Um, thank you. Um, Scottish Ministers are certainly of the view that the purpose and overall parameters of the regulation making power are, are clear by what's, what's set out on, on the bill. Um, the purpose of the regulations is to provide that we're a person, an individual or a community are being affected by issues connected to the land and there is a person who has control of land, they should be able to obtain information about that person. Um, in addition to the clarity hopefully provided by the drafting of the regulation making power, there's further information in the policy memorandum, the delegated powers memorandum, and an official's response to the committee's written questions, which hopefully provide sufficient additional background and information on the purpose and scope of the proposed regulation making powers. Um, the Scottish Minister consider it appropriate to carry out further consultation with targeted stakeholders on, on the, the detail of provisions and the detail of how the process will work in, in, in practice and therefore um, this is why we, we, we just, we've drafted the provision in, in, in the way that we have in order to, to carry out that, that, that further consultation. I mean, ultimately, it is, of course, for the Scottish Parliament to take the decision on, on, on whether Section 35 should be taken forward as, as, as currently drafted, and Scottish ministers will be happy to consider the, this committee's views as well as those of, of Rackin Parliament and stakeholders during this process. Thank you. And finally, has the government given um, any consideration to providing for this power to be subject to an enhanced form of parliamentary procedure? Um, yeah, and... 
as, as with uh, all, all the provisions um, throughout the bill, and considering that what procedure should be used, um, the Scottish Government have considered the two standard procedures for subordinate legislation, affirmative and negative, and negative procedure was not considered appropriate for these regulations, given that there is a significant level of detail to, to be set out in the regulations, and therefore we've adopted the affirmative procedure. Um, in addition to that, and we, we've also stated quite clearly that our intention is to, to, to consult further with targeted stakeholders on, on the detail that's to be set out in the regulations. And there is a requirement on Scottish ministers to do so set out in, in section 35.6. So with the affirmative procedure and the, and the requirement to, to consult, we had considered that that was a sufficient level of scrutiny to be provided for the exercise of these powers going forward. Thank you. For the time being, that's all I've got to say. Thank you, John. I think Stuart wants to continue the detail. Thank you. Um, just turning to some of the response to the committee, and one bit in particular, um, where you say it's an, uh, and I'm, I'm, my interest is the keeper of the land register. That's the domain I'm seeking to ask my questions in. Um, it's anticipated that information about an individual with a controlling interest will only be disclosed to the keeper with the consent of that individual. How can the keeper ask for that consent when the keeper may not know, it is not permitted to know who that person is of whom they can ask for consent? Um, the, this is one of the areas where we, the Scottish Ministers, we want to consult in, in, in quite a significant level of detail with legal representatives and, 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 and various stakeholders in, in determining. There are a number of options that have been considered from um, requiring the, the person who's making the application to um, confirm by, by ticking a box or signing a state statement to say that they have obtained the permission of, of the third party up to a requirement on the keeper potentially to, to write to the third party um, to, to inform them and give them a chance to, to, to object before the information appears appears on the register. So there, 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 are, there are a number of potential ways in which this could be affected and, and what the Scottish Minister's intention is is to, to work with, with stakeholders and those that are interacting on a regular basis with the registers to make sure that the, the most appropriate and, and least onerous um, procedure is used while obviously still making sure that the, the, the interests of the parties involved are protected. I, I, I can understand the issue of um, consent being withheld to the publication of the register, but your response says that it uh, is talking about disclosing information to the keeper in the first place. So if the information can't be disclosed to the keeper in the first place, how can the keeper ask for and obtain or be refused consent? Sorry, I'm, I'm not I'm well, not quite clear. It's, it's, it may, it, I'm not. I'm, 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 I'm referring to what you've said to the committee, where you've said it's anticipated that information about an individual with a controlling interest will only be disclosed to the keeper with the consent of that individual. So the keeper themselves cannot initiate the inquiry. It has to be a third party. Is that the implication? Yes, it is, it is the intention that the applicant would be um, required to disclose the information and therefore it would be on the applicant to ensure that they had the necessary consents and, and releasing that information to the keeper. So what I was referring to was the, the potential need for additional protections if they were required in order to, 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 to make sure those interests were protected. Do you really think in these circumstances anybody would give consent when they're not legally required to? We, we, we do think that actually there would, there would be... A, quite a strong positive response to providing this information, certainly in engaging with stakeholders such as Scottish Lands and Estates. They've been very positive about uh, about their commitment to, to, to better transparency on land ownership and we would we would anticipate that, that, that a number of, of applicants would, would voluntarily provide this provide this information. Um, and in requesting it sorry, I'll finish there. <laughs> Uh, possibly wise. Um, equally, just in terms of what's uh, currently before us, um, uh, in section 48A to A through to C, um, which covers the category of persons or bodies into which a proprietor of land falls and information relating to individuals. Uh, but the list is far from exhaustive uh, about what the keeper may ask. When do you think uh, it the list might be exhausting rather than not exhaustive? Um, 
I, I think it, I think there are probably broad areas and uh, ranges of information where uh, ideally we would we would love to ask um, those interacting with the, the land register to, to, to fill in numerous boxes and give us numerous amounts of information because information helps build evidence, helps assess policies. Now, there are broad ranges of use where this information can be useful. What we need to do is make sure that what we are asking um, of, of those that are interacting with the land register is, 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 is proportionate and, and, and reasonable and doesn't add an undue burden onto, onto applicants. Um, the point of registration with the land register is obviously to obtain your real right and so that, that also needs to, be, needs to be factored in. At the moment, on the basis of the, the work of the Land Reform Review Group from responses to the Scottish Government's consultation, from, from the Scottish Minister's own consideration of what information would be helpful to them, the, the two um, specific category of landowner and information on, on control and interest are those issues where we, which currently Scottish ministers consider to be most significant and most important in helping build a better picture of transparency of land ownership in Scotland. Now, as, as, as time moves on, um, and as um, policies and laws in relation to land and even objectives of land reform develop over time, um, it was just felt it would be important to have the scope to um, add in new categories in future if they were found to be necessary or even to remove former categories if they were no longer considered helpful or, or relevant. Um, so it's not anticipated that this is something that will grow exponentially or at a great rate, but we felt it was important to have the flexibility to make sure that we could address any, any future needs and, and keep what we are asking under review to make sure it remains proportionate and, and useful. Now, equally, your response to the committee suggests that quite a lot of the information that might be, might be sought by the Keeper will already be in the public domain. Um, will the Keeper have the power simply to incorporate that in the register without reference to anyone else? Or will it, and more to the point, will anyone have the right of veto of putting it in the register, even though it's in the public domain? Yeah. Um, at the, the moment, the, the provisions are very much based on uh, voluntary disclosure. Um, the, I think, if you'll allow me to refer to the provisions. I think, yes, at the moment the provisions are very much based on um, the provision of information by the applicant on interaction with, with the land register. Um, and that was just considered the, the, the most proportionate way to go at, at, at this stage. Um, I think there would be significant burdens on, on the keeper to start trying to put in this information um, with, with Based on, on I think where it, something was fundamentally clear from um, the, the information that provided to the keeper, there may be scope to consider that. But it certainly wouldn't. The Scottish ministers certainly don't intend to place the sort of burden on the keeper that would involve them to go out and do kind of any investigatory work to try and to try and gather that information. Uh, and finally, the, the, uh, initially when we're setting the regulations uh, about what the keeper's requests can be, that's an affirmative, but subsequently the plan is it be a negative instrument. Um, but given the uncertainty around this and the clear steer that we're getting as a committee that the, over the long term might be significant changes to this, wouldn't it be more appropriate, given that uh, subsequent instruments could entirely supplant the original, that it should throughout its life be an affirmative, affirmative instrument because of the significance of what it might cover. Yeah. Um, certainly it's acknowledged that subsequent regulations could alter the regulations substantially. However, they could not obviously make any changes to primary legislation without being, being subject to the affirmative procedure. Um, as noted in the Delegated Powers Memorandum, Scottish Ministers consider that any subsequent exercise of the power to be inserted into the 2012 Act is more likely to be amendment to the definitions contained in section 36 or even additions to the category of information on proprietors that, that may be collected. Um, this sh should not be a change in the overall policy of providing regulations that allow the keeper to request additional information, but will involve refinements to the definitions used in the regulations. And, and therefore, Scottish ministers had considered that negative procedure would be more appropriate. Um, again, uh, this 
Scottish Government would, of course, be willing to consider the views of the committee and, and Parliament on this issue. Should the, should the committee take a different, different view from the Scottish Ministers on this? Thank you. I'm wondering if I can just reflect on the difference between sections 35 and 36 and see whether I understand it correctly, and maybe I don't. I get the impression that section 36 is to give the keeper a power to ask questions which over time might cover all the land in Scotland in a fairly comprehensive kind of way. And clearly he wouldn't ask everybody the same question at the same time because that would be too much information. In contrast, it would appear that section 35 gives the power, the, the requesting authority, whoever that might be, the power to ask questions in what are very particular cases um, for particular purposes. Now, if I'm right in that, and Nodding Head suggests that I am, then I'm just wondering how it is that we would expect Scottish ministers to be able to draw up regulations under Section 35, which meet all those circumstances, if it's, by definition, dealing with particular cases, and whether, in fact, as a new case arises, it might be necessary, it wouldn't necessarily be necessary to bring forward a new regulation to cover a bit of information that you might not have had to for the first one. Am, am I right in, in painting that kind of picture? And if I'm right, how comprehensive do you think the first set of regulations under Section 35 might be? So we're not having to permanently revisit them every time a case comes up. Um, I think the general description of, 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 of the different aims, the, the, the provisions, is, is, is correct. I think they, they, they are aiming to achieve different outcomes, both very much relate to improving transparency and accountability of land ownership. But Section 35 is very much focused on the um, compulsory requirement of information in cases, in specific cases where there is a harm that needs to be addressed. Um, section 30 and Section 36 is much more broad. It's about the voluntary disclosure of information across uh, the, the broad remit of land ownership in Scotland and is much more intended to develop um, a better kind of evidence base in terms of official statistics on patterns of land ownership throughout Scotland. Um, the, the reason Section 35 has been drafted in a way it has, and certainly the wording of Section 35.1 and the reason Scottish ministers haven't focused on limiting it to um, particular or practical difficulties is to try and ensure that it's, it's drafted in such a way that, that any situations in which there's a justifiable reason to require the disclosure of information going beyond legal entities, the, the regulations will be broad enough to encompass that. Um, should in practice that turn out not to be the case, then it's hoped through making amendments to the regulations using affirmative procedure can react quickly to that and ensure that they continue to be functioning. But certainly the intention would be that, as, as, as first drafted, they should be sufficiently broad enough while respecting the rights of parties to, to cover the vast majority of cases in which it could be justifiable to, dis to require the compulsory disclosure of that information. If I've understood you correctly, you would expect those powers, the powers to be very widely drawn, but the purpose to be very narrow. Yes. 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 Yeah. Thank you. I think that takes us forward to John Mason on... 19. Thanks, Convener. Um, yes, the area I want to touch on is Section 79 and the conversion of the 1991 Act tenancies into modern limited uh, duration tenancies. So, I've got, I mean, I've got a series of questions. The first one, though, basically would be, can you explain what is, why it's considered necessary to have this power to uh, permit conversion uh, from the one to the other? And, you know, linked to that, is there an underlying policy justification uh, for this? why we believe it's appropriate to legislate to allow conversion. We had a review group that explored the overall issue of tenanting sector and what we needed to do to make sure it continued to be vibrant and also continue to have new entrants entering the sector and people progressing up the farming ladder. It's one box of solutions for the overall agricultural sector and the rural economy. Um, it's an important aspect of that. The review group found that the current I mean, I'm not, I'm not Sorry, I was from just a gonna, rural background. Sorry, that was kind of right. the, the overall intro right, into the right, situation. Okay. Maybe a bit too much, but the, the review group found that the, the current situation wasn't satisfactory in terms of allowing people an exit out of the sector, an effective exit out of the sector. 
So there were people sitting in 91 Act tenancies that were going to remain sitting there. The farm was going to be run down. The opportunity for them to exit wasn't attractive enough to give them a, a dignified retiral, and that blocked people coming into the sector as well. So it was a static situation that was getting worse. The solution to that was proposed was conversion, um, so that the tenant could have an opportunity to convert the tenancy, sell it on the open market, get some financial reward, etc. Out of that, and then new entrants and those progressing up the farming ladder had an opportunity as well. So that we were expanding the diversity within the agricultural sector, the resilience of it. The, the proposed conversion, and they proposed that there was a term with it, they recognised with that recommendation that there were issues that we had to the Scottish Government would have to resolve, um, particularly A1P1, the balance of responsibilities, rights, etc. Um, and that is what we've been doing in consult and we'll begin in terms of detailed consultation with stakeholders once we've worked out the pros and cons of all the solutions. So that's why we we believe that it's appropriate to take action. Um, now we're working out the precise detail of that action. Okay, I mean, it, it does come across as quite wide. Um, and that would it in fact be the case that all uh, 1991 Act tenancies could be converted? That is the intention that 1991 Act tenancies could be converted depending on the exact solution that we end up developing with stakeholders. I, would, I couldn't come down completely and see the range of circumstances because there's, there are options around this. Did I hear it correctly when you said just now and if they undergo such a conversion, then these tenancies could be sold in the open market? I think those were your words. Was that what you, that you is said? The, that is the intention. There is detail around that that we're still exploring, but that is the intention, yes. So so the, this is a new concept, then, to, to, to be able to sell a tenancy on the open market? Yeah, because the problem is identified as just now with the 1991 Act tenancies, there is not, for some, there is not an attractive exit out of the sector. So they can remain within their tenancy and the tenancy gets run down and the, the farmers in a the situation they don't want to be in and there's other people that can't get into the sector because these tenancies are tied up. It's one of the issues with the sector. Thank you. So just to clarify then, it's, it's because of this overall log jam that there's this whole concept of converting the tenancies. So therefore you wouldn't need to have a specific reason that some of the tenancies could be converted and some couldn't, because basically it potentially affects all tenancies. Is, is that it's an overall right? desire to have that flow within the system. Right. right. So can, I just, can I just explore that? Uh, and let's be clear, I have a constituent who's in precisely the position that you've just you've just mentioned. Probably aren't a huge number of them, but they just have to be dealt with, I would respect. Um, are we looking at a situation where all 1991 Act tenancies can be converted? And the condition is essentially who decides they want to, or are we in a position, do you think, where in principle they all could be, but subject to conditions, which are not the choice of either one or the other party, but actually might be some condition as to the current state of that lease or successes? Yeah, I'd, I'd say both of them are possible directions. I think the second one of um, there would be certain conditions that may have to be met um, is, is possibly more of a valid option to address the policy issue. But I'd, I'd stress we're still working through the policy options, the pros and cons of them, making sure that we're getting this balance right in terms of A1P1 ECHR. Um, so I couldn't land on exactly where it's going to go at this point, and, and nor should I. I think maybe I'll just add to what Billy's saying. Um, first of all, in relation to the concept of, of selling the tenancy, what, we're, what we really mean there is, is allow the tenancy to be assigned um, to another person. So it's assignation, right. rather than a well, sale of a tenancy. It's, 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 it's just, concept, it, yes. Yeah, so I, I think it's sale of a tenancy, just I think the kind of accessible language that we've, we've kind of gotten used to, to using in a build team to, to describe it. But ultimately, it's, it, it's assignation um, that would be permitted. Um, secondly, in terms of the, um, in terms of the, the regulations, in a sense, we, we're getting into, as Billy has, has mentioned, kind of hypotheticals. Un, until the consultation has been done, it's difficult to know where to draw the lines, what conditions one might add, one, which ones might not be necessary, because ultimately um, Article 1, Protocol 1 does require policy uh, evidence base um, for what's done. Um, for something to be A1P1 compatible, we, we need to have an evidence base. So until that's there, it, it's difficult to give a kind of, a, even in, an, in the abstract, unfortunately, a view that um, 
the power might say this or it might say that, you know, it might be used in a particular way or that way. Um, I, I appreciate that the power is, is, is widely framed. Um, nobody's disputing that at all. Uh, Josh, uh, thank you. Um, I, I, I can't help the feeling, though, that if you're that far back in the consultation process, then I'm just wondering why this is even on the face of the bill at this stage. I think the uh, Rural Affairs Committee will more worry about that than I do. Um, but we as a committee do have to worry about human rights issues. I mean, that is definitely within our remit. If you really can't establish that the position is even ECHR compliant before it's in front of us, then, then, then maybe that actually... To be clear, that's not exactly not what I'm saying. The, the, the power is capable of being exercised compatibly. It would not be in a bill otherwise. Um, and right. that's not just a view of the Scottish ministers. It's also a view of the presiding officer as well who's issued right. a certificate of competence. Um, in, in terms of what's in Section 79, it, the reason we, we have a, a long list of, uh, of things which deregulations can cover is to try to, to give some flesh on the bones. Now, clearly, um, th there's still some some evidence based to, to pull together to, to target the power. Um, but it's difficult to, to sort of put the cart before the horse by saying, well, we know we want to do this because we've got the evidence base for it finalised. Until that is finalised and it's clear and it's robust, it's difficult to know what the regulations might say. As I say, it's, it's, that's why we've taken a power, because... You know, the government has to have the flexibility to be able to um, to, to have in the bill something that has the headline policy in it, but also then to be able to, to expand on it by regulations. Um, sorry, what, John? Well, I'll just go back to this, um, the difference between assigning a tenancy and, se and selling a tenancy. I would like to be quite clear about this, um, because uh, how will assigning a tenancy relieve the problem that you've outlined in terms of the 1991 Act, uh, in terms of, uh, as defined by Mr Mackenzie, that it's a matter of not being able to get adequate compensation for, 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 for leaving uh, a tenancy and moving out of a, a tenancy. How then will assigning that tenancy attributive? I mean, I just want to be clear. Are you assigning it or are you selling it? Which is it? What? And why? Yeah, uh, my colleague will, will expand on the, on, on the policy. Um, but in, in terms of assignation, um, the, the assignor would approach an assignee and in return for value, for whatever the, the value of that tenancy would be to an incoming tenant, would in return give that money to the assignor. The assignee then steps into the shoes of the former tenant. That allows the, the former tenant to leave with the money um, and uh, the new tenant comes in. And that, that's essentially how the process is, uh, is expected to work. But so you're not selling the land in the normal sense of the word. It still reverts. It still belongs to the to the to the this owner. Is, absolutely, this uh, is this is assignation. There's, there's, no, there's no land yes. changing hands. It's merely the right to be there as a tenant, which can pass. It's the tenant's interest that, that right. is is passed. Nothing to do with the land ownership. Making the point, perhaps for the record, that a 1991 tenancy cannot be assigned. Cannot be sorry. Cannot be assigned, and that is the point. That at the moment there's limited assignation. Well, there's limited, limited, assignation, limited assignation, and therefore yes. there are tenants who, who who really don't want to be there, but can't do anything for practical well, yeah. commercial sense. That's my yes. understanding. Yeah, and that's why we're allowing the conversion into a term, and then that tenancy to be offered on the open market under certain conditions. So, so there is a value to be had for the existing tenant from the incoming tenant. To me, means it is being sold. The tenancy, yes. not the tenancy. Not yes, the I understand that. Farmland, and all tenancy, of this, yes. with or without um, the, forgive me for not being more up to speed on this, but all of this with or without the consent of the landlord. Again, we're still looking through the options on that. There, there are landlord's rights that we have to balance against the rights of the tenant. Um, so we need to get both of them finely balanced because it's important that we do not just for A1P1, but for the policy intention. We need to create some measure of confidence within the sector on both sides, tenants and landowners, so that tenanting land can continue to be made available. So we need to get that balance right completely. We can't say in terms of the fine detail of where that will go. That's clear. OK, thank you. That, I think, just explores that. Probably any further down there is a policy issue for, for the other committee, but I'd now like to return to John Mason, who was leading a line of inquiry. OK, um, so if I'm understanding this correctly, all tenants would have the uh, power to convert. So, so the, um, 
the discussions that are going on at the moment, the consultations are primarily about the conversion process, is that correct, rather than whether or not this there actually can be a conversion? It's the, it's the detail of the term of the tenancy that we would convert to and the detail of how it is targeted and who it is available to and how we ensure that we get the rights of the landlord addressed appropriately within that. It's all of that that's being considered. The overarching goal of conversion, we believe the, rev the review group made a convincing case, stakeholders have made a convincing case. We believe it is a absolutely appropriate to do it, but we need to make sure that we take the time to get the detail right, and that's why we've put this broad power in the bill. It's the right thing to do, but we need to take time to explore the fine detail of it. I mean, you do understand that you know this committee is a little bit concerned yeah. about broad powers, not just on this issue, but yeah. on any, because it, if, if it seems to be too wide. I mean, if I can dig down into a couple of things you said, I mean, that you said the length of the tenancy there, and, and there was an answer where I think it had been suggested that would be between 25 and 99 years. There's a range of suggestions. Some have suggested 15 years, some 25, some 35, some 99. Um, some actually wanted us to go the full way in terms of assigning the 91 Act tenancy and maintain it as a 91 Act tenancy. And um, we believe that didn't get the balance right, so we had conversion instead in the bill. So, uh, I mean, still, I think the answer we got from the Scottish Government was 25 to 99, although you're now saying it's actually wider than that, it's 15 to 99. I'm just right. putting forward the range of views that we've right. heard, and some have said 15, uh, but yes, 25 to Are we any closer more. to knowing than a figure, or will it not be one figure for everybody? It would... Hmm. I, this is almost deciding things that is not for me to decide. Right, okay, fair um, so there's a range of figures um, that we're considering. Now we've said you said already as well about the, getting the balance between the tenant and the landlord. I, I mean, as a layperson reading this, it does appear that there's the advantage is is, is swinging towards the tenant, which is a policy decision. So I'm not a, that's not my a question, a, although that was what it appears to be. Um, so are the landlords being safeguarded in this process? I mean, is there a kind of balance in here? Yeah, that's, that's why we've taken the time to go through the whole process to make sure that we do get the balance right. It's important that we try and maintain some confidence within the sector amongst the land, landlords, but it's also important that we address the problem that is there. Um, there are some who would say that the balance right now is too much in favour of the landlord, not enough in favour of the tenant. We have to look at the whole situation, including the overall agricultural sector, and get that balance right for both sides. Right, and as well as getting the balance right from kind of our perspective, also applying to ECHR, is that right? So, yeah. that, that you're, again, you're comfortable that that's where we're getting to? We're comfortable that conversion is capable of being legislated for within the competence of the Parliament and addressing A1P1. Right. Okay. Um, well, I, think, I think my final point then uh, is, I mean, given the significance of this power, which certainly does appear to me to be the case, um, and the policy is not developed, um, we're looking at a normal affirmative procedure. Is, is that uh, considered sufficient, or should it even be something stronger than that? Um, we believe we've got the structure right that the overall, the overarching bill has conversion, so there's debate within the Parliament right now on whether conversion in itself is something that's appropriate. Then we believe that we've got the regulations appropriately focused on affirmative because a level of scrutiny is needed because of the contention that lies below even the conversion. So there's contention at whether we should allow conversion and there's contention on what we should do in terms of targeting it, lengths of term, etc. So we believe affirmative is appropriate for those reasons. I think we're, like any area in the bill, we're open to consideration of that if the Parliament would, makes points. Right. Okay, I think that's okay for me. Thanks. Thank very much indeed. <coughs> uh, if I could... John, sorry. Yeah. Uh, given that this is an area of law where we have been found in the past, our Parliament, not to be um, ACHR compliant, and this is probably a daft laddie question, but... Um, can you and you tell us that you're, you're absolutely confident that this is A1, P1, um, to use your terms, uh, compliant? Um, can, you, can, you, can you, as it were, show us your working? I mean, maybe you already have um, as to the, the absolute thought process, the legal process that takes us to this conclusion. Can you provide that to the committee? I may be asking a, um, an unreasonable question, I don't know, but given that this is an area where the Parliament has already got into trouble and been rebuked, um, then be grateful if that could be done. Uh, you said that if I can, can 
answer that? Um, the, the simple answer is yes, we can give that insurance. The power is within competence. Um, the question, obviously, is, is how the power is exercised. Um, and obviously, when uh, the affirmative regulations would come before Parliament, at that point, Parliament would also have the opportunity to scrutinise them. Um, but as the power stands on the face of the bill, it is ECHR compatible, and we're confident of that. Beyond that, I, uh, I'm not free to, to divulge Scottish Government's legal advice, um, which I understand under the Ministerial Code. That yes, that's naive of me not to realise that, uh, possibly, but nonetheless, thank you. Something that we've provided, Raki, in terms of the consideration of A1P1 and the ECHR issue across the Agricultural Holdings Bill. So that would be useful information. Um, it was an annex to the letter or within the body of the letter, but there's pretty comprehensive text on what we need to consider to make sure we get the balance right that may help you. I think that would be helpful if that's not in the possession of the, this committee that would be helpful as that is one of our website at the moment Thank um it was submitted by written evidence uh, yeah. i think last week in which case i'm sure it's, it's, it's just a note of the scottish government's approach to article one protocol yeah. no that's fine thank you in which case we'll know where to find it thank you that's fine okay could i take you to section 81 and the sale to a tenant or third party where a landlord is in breach of an order or reward simply to note that where it's a sale to a tenant um, then the rules on that and procedure that are on the face of the bill, whereas when it's a sale to a third party, this is subject to regulations, and I'm just wondering if somebody can explain to me the nature of that procedural difference, please. Thanks. Thank you. Um, the tenants' provisions within the bill mirror the relevant sections within Part 2 of the Agricultural Holdings Scotland Act 2003, so they're a mirror of what's there already. The new affirmative regulations that would be prepared using the regulation-making power will set out the procedural aspects for the land court, valuers, auctioneers, other relevant parties who would be involved in the sale to a third party. So be quite technical in terms of the actual process they would all be required to follow because we would need to ensure that it was fair and it was transparent for everyone involved and also so the court was comfortable in bringing forward those procedures that the whole of the industry was behind them and on a level playing field. They're primarily technical in terms of the process that's going to be applied and how they're going to work. Um, they will contain um, information on who can and can't buy the land and a range of other elements set out in 38M which set the framework for what will be within the regulations, but there will be much more detail. It will also help um, manage the situation where future land prices fluctuate, perhaps within a regional area or across the country, and it will help manage that process and ensure that it's fairness to the landlord and the tenant and how that process works. Thank you for that uh, comprehensive answer. That's helpful. The government's written response states that the power in section 38M deals with procedural aspects on the sale of the holdings under the circumstances where the land court has varied in order for sale under section 38L. It appears, however, that some of the matters listed in section 38M2 cannot be described as purely procedural. For example, section 32M2E provides the regulations may include provision about persons to whom the land cannot be sold, and 38M2M provides that regulations may make provision about what is to happen where the land is not sold within a specified period. appreciate that's a detail you may not immediately have at your fingertips, but these matters in particular appear to be significant and not related purely to the sale process. Uh, why is it appropriate to leave them to regulations, please? Thank you. Um, in relation to the persons whom the land cannot be sold, we need to ensure that we're ECHR compliant on the actual provisions within the regulations on that. To, so it's clear to both parties that, it's, that this is not used as a tool or mechanism for them to wait to the sale to the third party to try and regain their family's interest in that land or the tenancy. So where the tenant has decided he does not want to sell the land, he does not want to take on the tenancy and he has notified the court and they have agreed to an order to enable the land to be sold mm -hmm. to a third party, that he is not using that as a way to come back in, he or she is not using that as a way to come in later on and try and get a knockdown price on the land when it goes for sale on the open market. Because of course, any agricultural tenancy sold in the open market with a sitting tenant on it will have a different price value 
to the value that that land would have without a tenant on it. Um, it's also to ensure that the landlord's family or business interests don't try and use it as a mechanism as well to try and secure the land back into the family business. So that's the reason why Section E is in Section M. We think the likelihood of the land never getting sold will be quite slim because the demand for land is so high. And regardless of having a tenant there, the demand is so great and the prices that land are going for are significantly higher than perhaps they might be in the future at some point. So we need to make sure that we allow enough flex to manage the process that if in the future land prices drop or the situation on the management of land changes significantly across the country, that we can manage that process and the land court have a process to follow that they are comfortable with and the auctioneers and the professionals in the industry feel is fair and appropriate. Do you see that as, as a fallback position sometime yes. in the future when you genuinely don't know what the circumstances will look like, but it yes. might just happen? Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much indeed. On that point, I think we go to Richard Baker on rent reviews. Please. Thank you very much, convener. The delegated powers memorandum and the written response explain that the policy on the new system of rent review is subject to an ongoing modelling process and to further consultation with stakeholders as well. Uh, and so for that reason, provision about significant aspects of the policy, in particular provision about the productive capacity and the standard labour requirement of agricultural holdings, is held over for regulations. Why should the Scottish Parliament confer power on the Scottish Ministers to legislate for this matter when the policy on significant aspects of it is still not yet clear? To the response on conversion, but even more so the Productive capacity, whether to move to productive capacity, there is some contention over. We, so we believe that is appropriate to put in the primary legislation, so there's appropriate scrutiny of Parliament and stakeholders off that. Underneath that, there's a lot less contention of what you need to do to determine, to define productive capacity and the factors you need to take account of. The meetings that are exploring this are getting closer and closer to a solution that all in the sector, landlords, tenants, valuers, are, are in agreement with. Um, so we believe it's appropriate that within the primary legislation the debate happens on the most contentious point of whether we should move to productive capacity. Underneath that we believe it's appropriate to have the other aspects and regulations and have it at negative because the contention there is, a mu is much less. It's very technical in terms of the things that we need to take account of in order to reach appropriate rental levels. That's where, that's where we're at just now on it. Um, and we are sharing work with Raki and we'll be willing to share it with others um, in, in Parliament on the detail of those meetings. We've suggested that we provide that material r around the end of October to allow the work to settle to a point where you can get a very good idea of where it is heading. Um, we, we, we're happy to supply material at any point, um, but that is the most appropriate, we think, to give you a really useful idea of where it is without providing you too much information that is still in flow of being agreed. By the end of, the, end of October, you'll think you'll be a lot further down the, down the line in terms of reaching conclusion on that? Yes, in terms of defining the productive capacity mm -hmm. and other factors that we need to take account of when determining rent. We're very close to broad agreement on certain aspects already and we should be progressing more in the technical detail by the end of October. So. You mentioned earlier the, um, the nature of scrutiny that should be over the regulations, and my next question is on that, because in the new process of rent review provided for by the Bill, the productive capacity of an agricultural holding is a highly significant factor in the term determination of the fair rent for that holding. Now, as allocated powers memorandum lists a number of elements of produ productive capacity, which the Scottish ministers may ultimately decide should or should not be relevant to the rent review process. So it does appear that there may be, in fact, a range of policy choices as to how productive capacity should be determined. And Parliament might expect then to have a greater role in scrutinising what these, you know, what are substantive choices, irrespective of the stakeholder engagement which has taken place. So why does the Scottish Government then consider that the negative parliamentary uh, procedure provides actually a sufficient level of parliamentary scrutiny on these very substantive matters? Yeah, I'd compare it to the conversion where underneath what's in the bill there's still a lot of contention on where we should go and a lot of options on where we should go on productive capacity underneath what's in the primary legislation there is a lot less contention about what we need to do to make sure there's a fair rent assessed 
um, and the technical details that go, that go within that. That's why I believe for conversion, it's appropriate to have the regulations that are affirmative because of the level of contention and the variety of options. For productive capacity, we believe there's a lot less contention. It's much more about the technical detail um, based on the advice that we're getting from the industry. The industry will shape this um, with us, providing the facilitation of that, but it will be the industry that shapes us to make sure that we get the detail right. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think that brings us to the end of, of our questions. Does Robert Gibson have anything else that he'd like to ask, please? No, I don't at the moment, thank you. But uh, the discussion is very helpful to the Rural Affairs Climate Change and Environment Committee in our deliberations on these matters, and uh, I'm sure we'll come back to them. Thank you. I'm just wondering if I could return to the issue about the timing that you've just mentioned at the end of October and just uh, suggest that it's quite important that the Scottish Government makes sure that the Parliament is on a timetable which is consistent with you nailing some of these things down. Um, I don't know where on earth we are on timetables. I mean, that will be a fact that is known. But clearly, if, if good information was to be arriving shortly after we've gone through stage one, that might be unfortunate. It might be rather better if stage one was after we've got a lot more detail. Rob. I understand it with my committee that we're talking about into December before we're writing our first stage report. So we should be able to review anything that uh, we get from uh, the government on this matter in and, good time. And it might be that we might be trying to relax what we're saying on the same timetable, but we'll talk about that separately. Okay, thank you very much indeed for your evidence. I'll just briefly suspend while we uh, move people around. And then we'll Thank, thank you very much. And if we can resume again, colleagues, um, thank you for your patience. That takes us back to agenda item number four, which is instruments subject to affirmative procedure. No points have been raised by our legal advisers on the qualifying civil partnership modification Scotland Order 2015 draft, nor on the mental health detention and conditions of excessive security Scotland regulations 2015 draft. The committee may wish to note, however, that the qualifying civil partnerships modification Scotland Order 2015 draft was withdrawn and relayed in order to make a clarification arising from a query raised by our committee's legal advisers. Is the committee content with these instruments, please? Yes. Thank you. Agenda item five, instruments subject to negative procedure. No points have been raised by our legal advisers on the Education Assisted Places Scotland Revocation Regulations 2015, SSI 2015 318, nor on the self directed Support Direct Payment Scotland Amendment Regulations 2015, SSI 2015 319, nor the Public Bodies Joint Working Integration of Joint Board Establishment Scotland Amendment No. 3, Order 2015, SSI 2015 321, nor on the discontinuance of legalised police sales Scotland Rules 2015, SSI 2015 324. Is the committee content with these, please? Yes, sir. Yep. Agenda item six, instruments not subject to parliamentary procedure, the Act of Sederant Rules of the Court of Session 1994 and Ordinary Cause Rules 1993 Amendment, Child Welfare Reporters, SSI 2015 312. This instrument amends the procedural rules of both the Court of Session and the Sheriff Court. Article 2 of the instrument inserts a new Rule 4922 into the Rules of Court of Session 1994. Article 4 insults a new rule 3321 into the Ordinary Cause Rules 1993. Paragraph 11 of each new rule provides that where a child welfare reporter acts as referred to in paragraph 10, the court or sheriff may, having heard the parties, make any order or direction that could competently be made under paragraph 6. 
Paragraph 10 in each rule is composed of subparagraphs 10a and 10b. Policy intention is that the phrase acts as referred to in paragraph 10 means that the child welfare reporter has acted as referred to in either subparagraph 10a or 10b. The drafting of paragraph 11 does not make this policy intention clear and the rule is capable of being interpreted so as to mean that the general welfare reporter must, in order to have ref act as referred in paragraph 10, have done things mentioned in both subparagraphs 10a and 10b. Does the committee agree to draw the instruments to the Parliament's attention under reporting ground H, as the meaning of Articles 2 and 4 could be clearer in that respect? Yes. Does the committee agree <coughs> to call on the Law President's private office to amend paragraph 11 in both new rules in order to make clear the intended effect of those paragraphs? Yes. No points have been raised by our legal advisers on the Marriage Prescription of Forms Scotland Amendment Regulations 2015, SSI 2015 313 nor on the Children and Young People Scotland Act 2014, Commencement Number 9 and Saving Provision Order 2015, SSI 2015 3.1.7. Is the Committee content with these instruments, please? Yes, Gender Item 7 is the Pendant Hills Regional Park Boundary Bill. Members are invited to consider the delegated powers contained in this bill. There are two delegated powers. Is the Committee agreed to report that it is content with both of the delegated powers in the bill? Yes. Thank you. Under item 8, Smoking Prohibition, Children in Motor Vehicles, Scotland Bill. This item of business is the committee to consider the response of the member in charge of the bill to the committee's stage 1 report. Do members have any comments? Noted. Are we content to note the response and, if necessary, reconsider it after stage 3? Yes. Two. Thank you. This brings us finally to agenda item 9, Interests of Members of the Scottish Parliament Amendment Bill. The purpose of this item is for the consider committee to consider the response from the Standards, Procedures and Public Appointments Committee to its Stage 1 reports. Do members have any comments? Stu? Uh, merely to draw the committee's attention again to the fact that I am the convener who has been writing to you. Indeed. Are we otherwise content to note the report and, if necessary, again reconsider the bill after Stage 2? Yes, sir. Yeah, thank you very much. That, I think, completes the public items, so I now move this committee into private.